You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. There are only three questions worth asking. One, where did we come from? Two, what are we supposed to do while we're here? And three, what happens next? All the rest aren't important. It took me a while to figure that out. I, I didn't get it at first. None of us did. But then, who does? What? Where am I? Wait! Oh. Oh. What in the... Hey! Can anyone hear me? Is anybody up there? Hey! Can you hear me? I had no idea how I got there. I must have blacked out on the way down because all of a sudden I couldn't remember anything. Not even my name. There wasn't much light at the bottom, just a steady, even gray, like, like fog with the sun behind it, only very far away. The wall was curved a little and made of some kind of smooth metal. At least, that's what it felt like. There was only one thing I could think of. If I was a prisoner, I had to get out. So I started exploring, feeling my way along. But I couldn't find a door, not even an edge to grab onto, nothing. I stopped to get my bearings, and then I heard it. Hooray, the fleet's in. Who are you? Oh, but it isn't the fleet, is it? It's the army. <laughs> then the army's in. Why are you dressed that way? What way? The makeup, the clothes. You, you look like a clown. You don't like my uniform? Oh, well, can't please all the people all the time. Nice uniform you have there. Hooray for the army. ta ra ra boom de yay Atten hut at your service. What are your orders, Colonel? General? Whatever you are. I'm a major. Oh, yes, I see that now from your collar. But don't fret about it. You can always advance, even in a peacetime army. Today a major, tomorrow a brigadier. <laughs> I wouldn't mind having you on the general staff. From major to brigadier, not bad. There's light colonel and colonel in between. You're generous, old sport. You're certainly gen Problem? No, no. No problem. It's, it's just that... Uh, just that what? A couple of small items seem to have eluded me for the moment. Such as? Such as... Who I am. Why, you're a major. According to your uniform, that's what you are. And that is what you said. Or are you impersonating an officer? That's a very serious charge, you know. Impersonating an officer. No, I... I am a major. Here's the insignia, so I know that much. But that's all I know. I, I must have been wounded or something. You seem to be intact. Then why can't I remember my name? I have no idea who I am. I don't remember my outfit or the action. Action? Which action was that? The engagement, the battle, wherever it was I got hit. Who says that happened to you? But I must have been wounded. Or at least I took a bump to the head. Did you hear cannon fire? Troops marching? Nothing like that, dear boy. It's been quiet as a tomb in here, which is restful after a fashion. Though it does get boring. Well, something happened to me. I got to figure this out. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What about you? That's a clue. Is there a, a circus in the area? A circus? What's with you? Look at yourself. The costume, the clown hat. Oh, I see. There must be a circus because I'm a clown. And clowns go with circuses. Everyone knows that. I guess it figures, doesn't it? But it should figure. A clown, a circus, an officer, a war. That's logical, except that it doesn't figure, not at all. Why not? Because, dear boy, there isn't any circus and there isn't any war. Then what are we doing here? Don't rack your brain, accept it. The truth is, you're just like the rest of us. You wake up and here you are. No reason, no explanation. You just wake up and here you are. Did you say the rest of us? See for yourself. See what? 
Come with me. I should have introduced you right off. Meet my friends, such as they are. This one we call the bagpipe player, for obvious reasons. Hello, laddie. And this is, well, I suppose one would call him a tramp or a hobo, judging from his stereotypical appearance. A familiar sight, no matter where one goes, wouldn't you agree? Hey, pal, you wouldn't have a drink, would you? And the most beautiful of us all, the ballet dancer. How do you do? How do you do? I'm... I'm... Don't worry about names. They don't remember theirs either. Gentlemen and lady, I'd like to introduce the Major. Hello. Meet our collection of walking, talking question marks. Five improbable entities who are all in the same predicament. Trapped side by side in a pit of light and darkness. No logic, no reason. Just a prolonged nightmare in which fear, loneliness, and the unexplainable walk hand in hand through the shadows. In a moment, we'll start collecting clues as to the whys, the whats, and the wheres. We will not end the nightmare. We'll only look more closely into the shadows in search of an explanation. Because you've already fallen with them, headlong and without a compass, into an uncharted region known as the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, Five Characters in Search of an Exit. Starring Jason Alexander with Stacy Keach as your narrator. The clown was right. One was a bagpipe player, complete with plaid kilt. The tramp was, well, a tramp by the looks of him. And the ballet dancer really was beautiful. She had on a white leotard and one of those little ruffled skirts, uh, what do you call them, uh, tutus. The four of them acted like they weren't surprised to see me there. Not a bit. But why? Why weren't they? If you don't mind, would... Would someone please tell me? Or is it a secret? Tell you what, dear boy? What do you think? What's going on here? Uh, going? Going where, old boy? I don't know. What are we? Who are we? None of us know, Major. We don't know who we are. Each of us... Each of us just woke up one moment, and here we were, in the darkness. But this isn't really darkness. Not quite. I can see all of you, and you can see me. It might as well be dark. The light, whatever it is, wherever it is, is so far away. I can't tell anymore if it's real or just something I'm imagining, because I need it to be there. Instead of... of... Of what? Of nothing. That's absurd. Is it? Each of you woke up, just like that. <laughs> Correct again. Give the man a cigar. But how did you get here? What were you before? Who put you in this place? You sure got a lot of questions. I told you, Major. We don't remember. Are you sure you didn't fall? We may have. The memory fades after a while. Well, that's how I got here. Did you? Yes, he did. He did indeed. I saw him. A nice pratfall, as a matter of fact. Quickly, before it fades, what's the last thing you remember before you fell? I don't know. I must be suffering from amnesia. Oh. Then you're like us. Time to join the big parade, Major. If you could find your hat and sword, you could lead us. Oh, what a splendid drum major you'd make. Followed closely by the clowns and acrobats, of course. This is... This is incredible. Oh, isn't it? What a troop we've put together. The crowd will love us. But how did this happen? How could it? That's the same question we asked ourselves. How could it happen? A question with no answer, Major. A question with no hint of an answer. At least, not a rational one. Nonsense. Everything has an answer. You just have to find it. Consider all the evidence, sift through the clues. Oh, is it this exciting? Where do you want to look first? It doesn't matter. Of course it does. Please, try to understand what I'm saying. It will be easier for you that way. We're things with no memory, no knowledge of what went before. 
no understanding of what is now, no knowledge of what will come. How long... how long have you been here? Hey, it's part of the mystery too. We don't know nothing. At least I don't. You got any ideas? No. No idea at all. Then don't fight it. Live it or live with it. Know what I mean? Whoever left us here must have a plan. How long will we be here until the next phase? Now that's a very good question. The best question of all. But alas, no one has the answer. You mean you don't? Who else is there? We've discussed it and discussed it like a proper committee, and we're no further along than we were at the beginning. Talk, talk, and more talk. So I ask you, man to man, clown to officer, what's the point? Sit down, Major. Conserve your energy. For what? For whatever the fates have in store. I suggest you listen to the beauteous ballerina and fasten your seatbelt, because we may be in for a very bumpy ride. Or then again, perhaps not. Perhaps what will happen is only more of the same. Perhaps we're all doomed to die of terminal boredom. <laughs> <laughs> Look at him. Active fellow. Very active fellow. Very much army, in other words. A man who has to do something, anything. A compulsive type. A regular worker ant. Well, you're a big time psychologist now, huh? By no means. I'm only a clown, which is neither here, there, nor anywhere. I could as easily be a financier, a certified public accountant, or a left-handed pitcher who throws only curves. What difference does it make? We're here because we're here because we're here. And what are you? You're an idiot. An energetic idiot, but an idiot nonetheless. You know you're wasting your time, don't you? I know I want out of here. I'm not satisfied sitting around and heaving deep sighs. I just want out. You have no monopoly on that, Major. We all want out of here. I second that emotion. Aye, but you're wasting your time. We've all gone around and around like bloodhounds with our noses to the wall. We can even give you the dimensions of the room. Thirty-nine feet. Starting where? It doesn't matter, does it? When you measure a circle, you may start anywhere. Am I right or am I right? What's the height? We figure about forty feet to the top. What's up there? Oh, the sky, artificial light... Maybe a fluorescent lamp, an illuminated microscope, you name it. One guess is as good as another. You have made guesses, then? Oh, all kinds. We could be on some other planet, or on a spaceship, or... Go ahead. Or we're all insane, and this is just a mirage, an illusion. Oh, we're dead. Dead to the world. Well, if we are... It certainly isn't heaven. How do you know? It ain't so bad. I've been in lots worse places than this. Limbo, then? Quite possibly. All together now. Limbo, limbo, limbo like me. Limbo, limbo, limbo like me. Or we really don't exist. We're figures in somebody's dream. Cogito ergo sum. I exist, therefore I am. Or each of us is having a dream. And everyone is a figment of someone else's imagination. Lots of possibilities. Makes your head want to blow up, don't it? That's one thing we have an abundance of. Possibilities. An infinite number of possibilities. What about getting out of here? Anyone examine that as a possibility? <laughs> have you? It's a solid wall. No crevices, no outjuttings of any kind. Nothing to hold on to or scrabble over or get your fingers around. Time to face the music, Major. We're trapped down here. There is absolutely, positively, no way out. A nightmare, then. That's all it is. A nightmare. It is indeed. But whose? Yours? Mine? The Scotsman? The ballet dancer? Just whose nightmare is it? Can you tell me that? It doesn't add up. Someone knows we're here. Of course. We do. <laughs> I mean someone else. Why do you say that? They have to. You've all been here a while, possibly quite a long while. So someone must feed you, someone must give you water. Yeah, well... <laughs> you would have thought so, wouldn't you? <laughs> Don't go jumping to conclusions now, laddie. Hold on. 
Someone must bring down food, or you couldn't survive. There's been no food, no water. That's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is it really? In that case, we'll starve to death, or die of thirst, or... That's the oddest thing of all. What is? Don't you understand yet? No, no, I don't understand. Why don't you tell me? Do you feel hunger, Major? Or thirst? Or heat? Or cold? Or fatigue? Discomfort of any kind? Or anything? Do you feel anything at all? No. No, I don't. But that doesn't prove anything. This has been... Uh, a trauma. It's natural that I don't feel thirsty or hungry. Not yet. I, I'm in a state of shock. Close, but no cigar. You were born in a state of ignorance, educated in the school of hard knocks, and got your degree at the street corner university. Now you're ready to graduate to oblivion. What do you say? Let's break out the booze and have a bowl. <laughs> None of us have felt thirst or hunger or anything else since we've been here. And we've been here for an endless time, Major. I can tell you that. Time without measure. What's wrong with you people? Have you tried shouting, calling for help? Endlessly. Well, then, have you pounded on the wall like this to get their attention? I mean loud. I'm talking about taking off your shoes and really pounding. Have you done that? Often. Well, well have you... Have you looked all the way around? Have you, have you felt every square inch of the wall? Maybe there's, maybe there's a control button or a panel of some kind, a hidden panel, or a lever, something. Yeah, yeah, sure. At the start, that's all we did. Hunted and searched and peered and felt with our hands. And you know what we found out? Sure you do. We found out that this, this right here, is the whole shooting match. This little room. What you see... It's what you get, Major. There ain't no more. Stop! Stop up there! Well, are you going to tell me? Tell you what, Major? What was that? That noise? It happens from time to time. A giant bell or something. That's what it sounds like. Yes, but what is it? <laughs> Another question, eh, boy? One more question without an answer. Well, then this is a madhouse. That's what it is, a madhouse. You're all loonies. You might be right, Major. But remember one thing. Whoever's ringing that bell, for whatever purpose, I think it would be safe to say that honestly and truly, absolutely and positively, it tells for thee. <laughs> Hey! Hey up there! It's no use. Let us out! Let us out of here! What do you want from us, please? Just let us out! Are you okay? Don't be afraid, Major. Take my hand. Where? Here. Please don't be afraid. In the beginning, in the beginning, it's, it's hard. But after a while... There must be, there must be a way. Something we can do. There has to be. This sort of thing, this, this sort of thing just doesn't happen. A few more like that, and it'll wreck my bagpipe. You there, girl. What is it? Why don't you dance for us? Leave her alone. It'll make the time pass. A capital idea. I'll play a tune. I've already danced for you. It doesn't do any good. Don't be modest. The Major's never seen you dance. How about it? The Major doesn't want to see her dance. Careful. You'll hurt her feelings. The Major's not interested in passing the time. All the Major wants to do is get out of here. And how do you propose to do that? All right. It's smooth. Absolutely smooth, unbroken, and high, too high. Not even a place for a foothold, nothing. That means we have to go through the wall. With what? Did you ever think of that, huh? A hole through the wall? Or what about the floor? What about it? If the wall is solid, smash a hole in the floor and tunnel out. 
Easier said than done. At least give it a chance. We don't know how thick it is. The wall or the floor. Or even what they're made of. Then find out. Find out. Don't just... Don't just sit there like, like lumps. Like things. Like mindless, soulless things. Playing your bagpipe. Telling her to dance. What's wrong with you? If this is a madhouse, maybe that's where you deserve to be, in a madhouse. And what about you, body boy? I think you're mad, all of you. I think you're out of your ever-loving heads. I know you are, but what am I? <laughs> try a hole through the wall, right about here. That's the first thing to do. Try to force a way through it. Industrious, isn't he? How about it, huh? A hole through the wall. See if we can get out that way. That's very bright. Terribly ingenious. Highly imaginative. Incredibly inventive. <laughs> Except for one thing. With what? With our bare hands? With our fingernails? With this. Why, wherever has your sword been all this time? It must have come off my belt when I fell into this place here. <laughs> Watch this. Now you've gone and broken it, dear boy. Nice sword, I must say. Was it Sheffield steel or only pot metal? <laughs> no. I will not have this. I will not have it. Major, please, Major, listen to me. After a while, after a while, it becomes easier. I promise. I need to make a plan. I need to do something. Perhaps, perhaps there have always been dungeons like this. And we've just never heard of them before. Maybe they're for... for the unloved. Maybe that's what we are. The unloved. Don't let me hear you talk that way. Come here. Get a hold of yourself. Think. Don't be afraid. We have names. We're people. And that means we belong somewhere. Do we? There are others who care about us. You can count on that. Somewhere, somehow, we've got a life of our own, each of us, and people who care and remember out there. And we'll find them again, together. Do you really think so? I'm sure of it. A tunnel, that's what we'll do. We'll dig a tunnel. The boy simply doesn't give up, does he? I've got it. Got what, pal? I know where we are. It suddenly occurs to me. <laughs> it's... It's funny none of you ever thought of it, but it has to be. Where? Where are we? Why, my dear young lady. How unobservant of you. When the whole thing fits together so... perfectly. Do you need me to draw you a picture? Please tell me. Ladies and gentlemen, it seems quite apparent, doesn't it? Absolutely unequivocal. We, all of us, are in hell. God, God help us. We are in hell. Never say die, that one. He'll come to accept it eventually, just as we did. Eh, let him be. If he gets some satisfaction out of banging a broken sword on the floor, well, let him have his fun. At least he's trying. He is indeed. He's been trying for several hours now. You can't help but admire that kind of persistence, even though it's a little like trying to empty an ocean with a cup, or count the grains of sand in a desert, or reach up to touch the stars. So, let him dip and count and reach all he wants. Of course, it won't help, but I fail to see how it could hurt under the circumstances. <sighs> it's metal, or the hardest wood I've ever come across. Circular, perfectly smooth, with no breaks anywhere. All of which we could have told you some hours ago. Which we did tell you, if you'd bothered to listen. We've got to figure out something else. Oh, do, do. Maybe we could wish it all away using the power of positive thinking. That's enough. Or bore through it with our X-ray eyes. 
Anyone have a laser beam handy? I said that's enough. Or make believe we're acrobats. You know all about that, right? Clowns, acrobats? Most definitely. Alley-oop and over the top to freedom. <laughs> now you got it. <laughs> yeah, you got it, all right. Dreaming and wishing, wishing and dreaming. Hold on. Listen to the man. Oh, come now. In the final analysis, this is all rather idiotic. Is it? It only requires a moment's reflection to see... Why not? Why not what? What you said. Acrobatics. A figure of speech, my dear, not meant to be taken seriously. Isn't it? I will grant you that we have somehow forfeited some of our human dignity, but we are nonetheless governed by human frailties, not the least of which is gravity. You may know some advanced acrobatics that I'm quite unaware of, but for the moment, unless you can find a circus gun big enough to launch one of us skyward like a human cannonball... I see what she's getting at. Well, kindly elucidate, if you please. Don't any of you see? Yes, of course. One on top of the other, standing on each other's shoulders. What about that? It's the way they do it in the circuses, isn't it? Is that query directed at me? You're a clown, aren't you? I'll ask one if I see him. I can assure you I may wear the costume of a clown, but I have no recollection whatsoever of having been one, if ever I was. Then the only thing you ever were was a coward. That's uncalled for. Consider the consequences. We may not feel thirst or hunger, but the pain of a broken bone is quite another thing. We might very well feel pain, and a fall from, what, 10, 15 feet up, down to this hard floor, well, that's a sensation I'd as soon do without. It's a chance. With all due respect, miss, no thank you. She's right. It is a chance. Consider the consequences of not trying. It won't work. The weight will be on the first person, so I'll bear the brunt of it. That light's too far away. Come on. The clown on top of me, then the tramp, then the bagpiper, then the dancer. What do you say? Uh, we'd never reach it. Well, never say never. We don't know how high it is. That's the point. We'd be exerting ourselves for nothing. It could be a hundred feet up there for all we know, or two hundred or three hundred. But we got nothing to lose, right? Why don't we sit down and have some entertainment instead? A much safer course of action. Why don't we go for it? Come on, clown, up on my shoulders. Oh, observation. Things were far simpler before you arrived. However, I suppose I must go with the majority. Get a foot on my shoulder. I'll boost you up. Careful now. That's it. My turn? Not yet. The bagpiper next. Give me a hand, laddie. Use the wall for leverage. I can barely manage. But it's holding. All right, miss. It's up to you. How high is it? Can you see an, an edge or anything yet? I guess seven or eight feet to the top. Maybe more. Maybe less. Come on, I can't hold this weight forever. Go very carefully, one step at a time. You'll make it. Thank God she's so light. Whoa! That's my nose you're stepping on. Now stretch! I am stretching. All the way up. Now, what do you see? I, I can't quite reach it. It's still, oh, about eight or ten inches above me. Up on your toes. That's it. I'm almost there. Everybody straighten. All I need is a, a few more inches. No! No! We were so close. Yes. I think we were. We'll try again. Nonsense. We could have broken our necks. But we didn't. I, for one, am not trying it again. How much farther? How much more would it have taken? Only a few inches. I could almost, almost feel it. What if... What if what? I respect persistence as much as the next man, but stupidity, that happens to be a waste of time. A useless expenditure of energy. If we were just a few inches shy, if that's all it took, I could straighten up more on the bottom. We could each straighten an inch, two inches. That would give her the height she needs. Let's go. One more time. My dear young warrior... Would that you had not arrived. Things were so much more peaceful before. Why not? We got something else to do? Not that I can think of. Please, I was so close. And heaven help us all. Leave us give it the old college try. 
Come on. Right, steady now. Oh, steady. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, right. Easy. Just yes. a little more. Okay. Right. Watch the foot. Oh, oh, there you go. Oh. This is as tall as I can stand. Quite an exercise for the lowest spine, I must say. Now, young lady. Here she goes. Oh, there's a rim of some sort. Yes, I think I have it. Now pull yourself up. Hold on. Yes, by all means. Uh, I can't. How's the leg, miss? The knee's twisted, I think. But it'll be all right. You were almost there. You had your fingers over the ledge. A miss is as good as a mile. Not in this case. A miss by about two or three inches? <laughs> That's hardly a mile. This is what we do next. Oh, share your plan, pray tell. The same thing. Without the dancer. Then we'll be several feet short. No, we won't. Hear me out. The clown, the tramp, the bagpipe player, and then I'll climb to the top. I'll tie a rope to the haft of this sword, fling it over the edge. Let it catch there like a grappling hook. Now that's thinking. Ingenious. But first, hadn't one of us better run over to the hardware store and pick up the rope? He's right. There's no rope around here. Strips of cloth. Torn from what we're wearing. You mean tear our clothing? It's a chance. And a good one. Yours has the most material. You said yourself you don't feel the cold. So give me those balloon sleeves. The things we do for a man in uniform. Six feet of excellent material, courtesy of Pagliacci, or whoever I am. Good, but I need more. Twist it and start tying it together. Big knots. That's it. Takes me back to my Boy Scout days. Were you a Boy Scout? Who knows? I might have been. I got one question for you. Hi. What the heck is a Boy Scout? Anybody remember? We're almost ready. Now this time... We make it. The rope tied to the sword and over the top of the ledge. It catches, and I'm up and out. And then what? We'll worry about that when it happens. Somehow, I will get you out of here. All of you. But nobody gets out until one of us does. Now that's a logic you can live with, right? If we live. You, Tramp, it's time. Indeed. Leave us, get on with it. I can't take this much longer. Good luck, Major. Thanks. I'll need it. Uh, uh, all right, all right. Easy. Now swing that rope, man. You can do it. Right him, cowboy. You got it. Almost. Watch out below. One more time, Major. I believe in you. Second time's the charm. Good show. I believe he's done it. How does it feel? Tight. I think it'll hold. Then go. Major, you don't know how spectacular you look. At least the weight's off. Quick, everybody down before we fall down. Got the ledge. There. Yes. If I can pull one leg up. No. Well, what's there? What do you see? Major, Major, you've got to tell us. Where are we? No, 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 no. And I knew then what I had known all along, but didn't want to face. Some things, I guess, are too fierce to handle in one bite. I heard the wind, and I saw, finally saw, where I was, where we all are. I wished the four of them well. If you see my friends, will you tell them I love them? Because the truth is this. There are only three questions worth asking. One, where did we come from? Two, what are we supposed to do while we're here? And three, what happens next? All the rest aren't important. I didn't get it at first, but then, who does? Maybe it's better that way. No! 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 He made it. I don't believe it. I do. A brave man. Very brave. But not a very bright one. I wonder if we'll see him again. He'll be back. 
I know he'll be back. And then what, dear lady? He'll come and get us. You think so? He may be back, but it won't be to get us. How can you say that? I'm beginning to get a feeling. And not a very nice one, I'm sorry to say. All the little details, they're starting to fit together. This place, our costumes, the bell. He may have been right at that. What do you mean? He may have been right all along. This may very well be a, a kind of hill. At least for us. <laughs> One from which there really is no escape. No escape at all. <laughs> Look, what do you have there? I found it in the snow. Someone must have dropped it. Oh, thank you, dear. Just drop it in the barrel there, would you? He looks like a soldier, but his coat's all torn. That's all right. Someone will sew him a new one. I'm sure he'll make some little boy very happy. Wow, you got lots of dolls in there. Not as many as we'd like. They're for the orphans, you know. But it's early, and we've just started. Can I have one? Are you an orphan? Well, no. But I like the ballerina. She's so pretty. Oh, yes. She is, isn't she? What's that on her face? Hmm? See? On her eye. It looks like a real tear. Is she crying? No, why would she be crying? It's just a snowflake that started to melt. I suppose you could have her if you promised to give her a good home. Mm, no. I think I better leave her here. Are you sure? She doesn't want to go. See? She's holding hands with that soldier doll. Why, aren't you the nicest little girl? Toys for Christmas. Toys for Christmas. Open your hearts, friends, and bring in your old dolls so the underprivileged little ones can have a happy Christmas, too. Help the Salvation Army. Dolls for Christmas. Dolls for Christmas. Dolls for Christmas. Just a barrel, a dark depository in which reside counterfeit, make-believe pieces of plaster and cloth and plastic wrought in the distorted image of human life. But this added hopeful note. Perhaps they are unloved only for the moment. In the arms of children, there can be nothing but love. A clown, a tramp, a bagpipe player, a ballet dancer, and a major. Our cast of players on a very odd stage known as the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Five Characters in Search of an Exit, starring Jason Alexander with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling, based on a story by Marvin Peddle. Heard in the cast were Kathy Garver, David Darlow, Doug James, Christian Stolte, Frenette Lebo, and Amanda Omari. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You're traveling through another dimension. 
a dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Yes, yes, Pete, here's a nut for you. Now, don't bother me, if you please. <laughs> I have work to do. I'd like to speak to Mr. O'Connor, please. <clears throat> That's right. Um, I'd rather not say. It's rather <laughs> personal. That's it, Pete. Stay on your perch like a good bird. It's a boy. <clears throat> Is this Mr. O'Connor? Mr. O'Connor, uh, I'll get right to the point. You have a young gentleman working for you in personnel. His name is... Uh, Brewster. Alfred Brewster? Been with your firm about a year and a half? <clears throat> well, I'll tell you what about it. The man is a communist. That's correct, a communist, with certain terrorist affiliations as well. Never mind who this is. Let's just say a concerned citizen, all right? What is of the essence is the character of one of your employees. I happen to know that this man, Brewster, is a subversive and a menace to our society. What am I suggesting? Why, I think it's obvious. I'm suggesting he should be discharged immediately, given his walking papers and shown the door. Never mind how I know. I know, that's all. That's all. Now I'm going to check back in a few days, and if he hasn't been discharged, I'll be forced to take this matter to a higher authority. That's right, to the corporate office. Correct. Goodbye, Mr. O'Connor. <sighs> Rather a full day, Pete, wouldn't you say? Eleven so far. Eleven names on this list. I better sharpen my pencil. And scratch off one more. Of course, it's questionable what concrete results we can expect. But at least the seeds have been planted. Oh, yes. The opening guns fired. The first salvo, so to speak. Hello, Board of Education? Well, please connect... Yes, I'd like to speak with the superintendent of schools, please. It's a personal call. No, I'm not at liberty to give my name. That's right. It's urgent. Is this the superintendent? Yeah, this is a concerned citizen. I'm calling about a teacher in your employee. That's correct. His name is... His name is Farwell. William J. Farwell. He teaches at your North End High School. That is correct. The man is morally objectionable. He's a drinker, a carouser, and I have it on good authority that his relationships with students are questionable at best. The man should be investigated immediately. Oh, yes. Never mind who this is. I happen to be giving you facts, and that is what is at issue here. Well, you best check on him. You most certainly should, and without delay. Quite right. Here you are, Pete. There you go. That's a good bird. You know, I'm rather tired. It's been quite a full day. You don't realize just how tired you can get during a campaign. But a dedicated man isn't concerned with physical discomfort or fatigue or anything else for that matter. No, a truly dedicated person is interested only, only in victory in the conquest of morality over the forces of immorality.
Hey, look at them out there. The dregs. Carrion. Leeches sucking us dry. Oh, yes. Carrying evil around with them like infectious germs. We're gonna have to face it sooner or later. Huh? Phone calls are one thing. Threats and exposure is simply expedience. No, Peter, my friend. We're gonna have to embark on a much more ambitious course. Some major surgery, I think. The long scalpel, honed sharp and cutting deep. If the sickness is extensive, so must be the cure. And it must be today, Peter. It must be today, this afternoon. Uh, four o'clock. Oh, yes, that's when it will occur. Yes, we'll make it occur at four o'clock. At that moment, at that moment, we will destroy evil. That is both my charge and my obligation, Peter, to destroy evil. And we shall do it at precisely four o'clock. I'm not sure of the method yet, but it'll come to me. Oh, yes, it'll come to me. Most assuredly, it will come to me. And it'll be a revelation, an epiphany. It will be... It will be the expiration of immorality everywhere. The exordium of the end. Four o'clock, Peter. That's when we'll have it happen. Whatever it is. Four o'clock this very day. This is Mr. Oliver Krangle, a dealer in petulance and poison, a self-appointed, self-designated, self-ordained vigilante whose jaundiced eyes peer out at an unholy world and find it undeserving of anything but judgment and punishment. And Mr. Oliver Krangle is both the judge and the executioner. He has rather arbitrarily chosen 4 p.m. as his personal gotodamorum. We are about to watch the metamorphosis of a twisted little fanatic poisoned by the gangrene of prejudice, to the status of an avenging angel, upright and omniscient, dedicated and fearsome. Whatever your clocks say, it's almost four o'clock. And wherever you may think you are, at this moment you happen to be in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Four O'Clock, starring Stan Freeberg with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Yes? Mr. Krangle? What is it? Well, there's a special delivery for you. Uh, just a minute. <sighs> Here you go. A whole lot of stuff. Eight or ten envelopes, at least. Thank you, Mrs. Williams. Uh, something else, was there? Something... No, nothing else. Then in that case, why do you stand there trying to read the contents of these envelopes as if you were an x-ray machine, hmm? Me? Read your mail? Oh, I can assure you, Mr. Krangle, I have many more things to do than trying to read my tenant's mail. Your mail in particular. Huh, I feel reassured. You sure get enough of it. Somebody think you were running some sort of mail order business or something... Just look at that desk of yours. So much mail and papers, and I don't know what all. What is your business, Mr. Krangle? What I do is none of your concern. I pay my rent on time, huh? And I keep to myself. A respect for privacy you should learn, Mrs. Williams. Well, I never... Uh, you never? Uh, that's good to know. Now, have you any more comments to air? Because if not, I would greatly appreciate your leaving me alone. I have a great deal of work to do. I believe that. The question is, what kind of work? You should believe it. You may thank me one day, Mrs. Williams. Oh, yeah. You and everyone else. Assuming you're still around, and assuming you retain the capacity to feel appreciation. What's that supposed to mean? Assuming I'll be around. Are you threatening me or something, Mr. Krangle? 
Threatening you, Mrs. Williams? I don't threaten people, my dear lady. I compile files on them. I compile them, and I analyze them, and I investigate them. And then I categorize them, and I judge them. Oh, yes. If they're impure, they must be punished. If, on the other hand, they're simply misled or naive or unsophisticated, I point them to the right way. I lead them by the hand, Mrs. Williams. I show them the proper course, the path to redemption. Is that... <laughs> what I mean is, is that what you do for a living? Indeed. In short, I check evil, Mrs. Williams, and I eradicate it, inoculate it, wipe it clean, and sponge it away. And you know where these... these evil people are? I most certainly do, Mrs. Williams. Can you give me an example? How about this one? <clears throat> Mrs. Claire Williams, age 54, widow, formerly married to John Alistair Williams. Political affiliation, none. Husband's political affiliation, none. Evidence of subversion, none. Negative personality traits, curiosity, and ignorance. Of course, that's just a preliminary report, Mrs. Williams. The in-depth research is in the master file cabinet right over there. Oh, well... <laughs> Aren't you the strange one? You ain't nothing if you're not a strange one. I'll be going now, Mr. Krangle. Had your nap, Pete? All rested up, are we? Eh, well, that's a good young parrot. It's going to be an exciting afternoon, Pete. Big things are going to happen at four o'clock. Eh, yes, they are indeed. Four o'clock? What's going to happen at four o'clock? Interesting question, Mrs. Williams. A very interesting question. Very much to the point. What's going to happen indeed? At four o'clock, we're going to expose evil. Strip it bare. Push it out into the light. Dissect it. Pinpoint it. And eliminate it. You are? Exercise it. Denude it. Confute it. Destroy it. Oh, now, careful, Mr. Krangle. You gone and broken your lamp. What? Oh, oh, the lamp. Uh, I see. Uh, sorry. Well, no matter. Would you like me to clean that up for you? No, I'm quite capable of cleaning up after myself, madam. That's one thing I'm very good at. Cleaning. Uh, something else was there, Mrs. Williams? No. No, I, I, I don't believe so. If it's all the same to you, I'll just... I'll be on my way. Saints preserve us. Excuse me. <gasps> oh. oh, yes. I'm looking for a Mr. Krangle. I can't imagine why. I was told he lives in this building. Oh, he lives here, all right. There ain't no doubt about that with a vengeance. He lives here right there at the top of the next landing. But if you ask me, young woman, you won't be going in there without police protection. Is that right? If you ask me, the man has a leak in his attic a mile wide. I ain't sure anymore that... That he's safe to have around. Mr. Krangle? <clears throat> Mr. Krangle? Well? My name's... Who else is with you? Why, no one. Are you sure? Yes, quite sure. My name is Lucas... I wonder if I could speak with you for a moment. Lucas, Lucas, ah, yes, Lucas. Kurt J., age 27, intern, Eastside Hospital. That's my husband. Is he indeed? Well, now, well, now, your husband, you say. Uh, come in, please, please, come, come, come. Uh, have a seat, by all means. Thank you. Now, uh, what about your husband? Why, Mr. Krangle? Why what? Why are you trying to hurt him? Hurt? 
My dear lady. What has he ever done to you? To me? Why, nothing to me. Th that is, nothing personally. I don't know your husband, Mrs. Lucas. That is to say, I know of him. Oh, yes, I know of his background, but we've never met. He's a stranger to you, then, isn't he? He's a perfect stranger. A stranger, yes, but not a perfect stranger, Mrs. Lucas. Uh, by no means. Your husband happens to be most imperfect. And when you perceive, quite correctly, that he's done nothing to me, at least not directly, I hasten to enlighten you. He nonetheless happens to have done a great deal against society. In what way? Ho, ho, don't play dumb with me. Don't give me any of that naive stuff. My husband, for your information, Mr. Krangle, is a dedicated young doctor. A gentle, decent, fine human being. He has only one abiding interest in life, and that is to cure, to heal, to stop pain. And to kill. How can you say such a thing? Yeah, that's his other abiding interest, the one you've conveniently skipped. L, 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 U, C, Lucas. Uh, here we go. I know his file well. <clears throat> Lucas, Kurt J, M.D., second year intern, Eastside Hospital. This year, on the night of March 12th, while serving in the emergency ward, he permitted the death of one Mrs. Angela Rienti by failing to relieve pressure accumulated as a result of a brain injury sustained in a traffic accident. It wasn't his fault. It was too late. That's his only crime. He wasn't able to treat her because he was responsible for half the ward that night. And by the time he got to the woman, she was already dead. That's your interpretation. It's not an interpretation. It's a fact. It's exactly the way it happened. By the time he got to her, by the time she was put into his care, she'd already died. He should have gotten to her earlier. How could he? Do you know how many lives he saved that night? How many people he saves every day, every week? He did nothing to her. That's about the size of it, Mrs. Lucas. Miserable dereliction of duty, resulting in the untimely death of a woman who by rights should be alive today. These facts came to my attention, and I simply called them to the attention of the hospital supervisor, an institution, by the way, which I helped to support through taxes. By what right? I must ask you, Mr. Krangle. Excuse me, but... By what right do you presume to pass judgment on my husband? You're not even a medical man. Why, why, you weren't even there that night. You don't know anything about it. And yet you write your letters to the hospital, dozens of nasty letters accusing my husband of being a, a murderer. Why, you, you wretched, small-minded. Enough, Mrs. Lucas. That will be quite enough. I've suffered your presence here, but I'm not required to tolerate your abusiveness, although I don't wonder you're the type of woman you are. Oh, and what type is that? You're obviously greatly attracted to your husband, and there's no secret that birds of a feather... Well, you know the rest. I think I catch your implication, Mr. Krangle, and you're over the line, way over the line. You're as cracked as that... that lamp of yours. Hmm, tell me, has the hospital discharged your husband yet? Discharged? That's right. Let him go. Cashiered him out. Eradicated him from the payroll. Given him the sack. I've been expecting it momentarily. They have not, Mr. Krangle. They have done no such thing. It'd take more than a letter-writing campaign from a... A crank like you to make that happen. Your husband is an evil man. He is no such thing. And I will not put up with evil in any form. And I will not stand by and allow an injustice like this. Of all the presumptuous, wrong-headed... I... I'm sorry, Mrs. Lucas. <clears throat> I haven't any more time. Why, look at the hour. It's three o'clock already. I got things to do. Many more important things to do, thank you. Today's mail, for instance. You'd probably be interested in these. They're cases not unlike your husband's. 
communists, subversives, thieves, harlots, but all made out of the same metal. Evil, Mrs. Lucas, all of them evil, and I will not countenance evil. I am absolutely incapable of countenancing it. You're probably unaware of it, Mr. Krangle, but my husband is a very sensitive man. Oh, please, spare me. Your letters have had an effect on him, if on no one else so far. The people at the hospital tell him to ignore the letters, forget about them, but they're tearing him up inside. They're killing him. His confidence in himself, his ability to concentrate and work. You see, he's like a lot of doctors, Mr. Krangle. He cares. He cares very deeply. So, you see, you really have been quite successful after all. I imagine you've been equally successful with other people, too. Mm -hmm. There's too much sanity still left out there for you to have succeeded in having them all fired. Mm -hmm. But you must be hurting them, those men and women, mm -hmm. hurting them desperately, as you've hurt my husband. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you've really accomplished a great deal. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. Tell me, Mr. Krangle. If you can, that is. Why? What's that? Why do you do it? I really need to understand. Why? You ask me why? Why? Because they're evil. That's it precisely. Nothing too complicated about that, is there? They're evil. Plain and simple. Here, take a look out the window. All those little bugs down there, you see? Bacteria. That's what they are. That's what your husband is. All those little... <laughs> That's it. That's precisely it. What is? That's what I'll do. I've finally gotten the clue. I said little, little, you understand? <laughs> That's what I'll do. I'll turn all the evil people into, into little ones, understand? I'll make all the evil people, uh, let's see, three, three feet. No, two feet, two feet tall. That's it. At four o'clock this afternoon, at precisely four o'clock, every evil man and woman will become a mere two feet tall! <laughs> a revelation! An absolute revelation! Peter, my lad, did you hear what I came up with? Did you? Hmm. That's it! Do you see the beauty of it, Pete? That's it! It's brilliant! Absolutely brilliant! Two feet tall, Pete! Two feet tall! <laughs> At four o'clock this afternoon, I'm going to turn all the evil people, the wicked, morally stunted troublemakers everywhere, into tiny little freaks for all the world to see. I'll make them all two feet tall. Two feet tall, I say. Yes, it'll be better than if they wore badges on their clothing. Impossible for them to hide. The purest form of poetic justice. Evil will be made an object of universal scorn, laughter, humiliation. Yes, yes, you're not. You're hungry. Aren't you, Pete? Here. Here you go, boy. I won myself. <laughs> we must be strong, the two of us. Strong for what's about to happen. <laughs> That's right, Petey. Ten minutes past three. It won't be long now. Yes, yes, a peanut. Here you are. That's a good strong boy. <laughs> I'll bet you could crack open just about anything with that great big beak of yours, couldn't you? Yes, you could. I'm sure you could. <laughs> Look at him down there, all those wicked little people. They don't know just how little yet. No, of course not. But they will. 
They will. It's their day of judgment. Oh, yes. Time to finish our preparations, Pete. There's much to do. Eh, less than 50 minutes left now. Must be sure all our pencils are sharp. We have a great many names to cross off the list. Cross off the list. Soon now. Very soon. Yes, yes. Oliver Kringle? Come in, come in. Uh, yes, I'm Oliver Kringle. Uh, I'm the one who called. Yes, sir. Agent Luther Hall, Mr. Kringle, Federal Bureau of Investigation. Our office received a call. Indeed, indeed, yes. Uh, I placed the call and asked you to come. Uh, I felt it was my civic duty. Uh, uh, can I get you a cup of coffee or something? No, thank you. Now, Mr. Kringle, you told the office that you had some sort of list, proof of criminal activity, and that today would be a day of reckoning. Uh, what exactly did you mean by it? Sit down, please, yes. Uh, there's plenty of time. We have more than 45 minutes before it happens. Before what happens, Mr. Kringle? <laughs> That's the point. That's the whole point. That's why I called you here. And why is that? <clears throat> I felt the FBI should know. I also called the police and the fire department. I even got a call into Washington. Oh, yes. Although the latter message probably won't go all the way to the top. <laughs> it's my understanding that the Reds are in complete control in Washington now. I imagine they've taken over the switchboards, too. The Reds, Mr. Kringle. Oh, yes, indeed, the Reds. It's a complete conspiracy, you know, Mr. Hall. All the evil people are banding together now. All the subversives, the commies, the terrorists, the thieves of the American dream. It's a total, absolute, worldwide conspiracy. You said on the phone that you had a plan of some sort. Oh, my, yes. It all takes place at four o'clock. I thought you people ought to know because... Well, you'll have your hands full. Our hands? Picking up all the guilty parties. Oh, yes. You see, Agent Hall, I've spent a good many years doing this kind of work. Just look at all those file cabinets there. Years of dedication to the cause. I've made a study of evil. Oh, yes, indeed. A complete study of it. I cut out newspaper clippings. I listen to the radio and watch television. I follow every major court case that's going on. I compile a completely airtight list of charges against all of them. The evil people. What do you do with them, Mr. Kringle? Do with them? I follow through, of course. I follow them through to their conclusion. I write letters to employers. I, I make phone calls late at night. Oh, they hate that. Oh, yes. It's one of the most effective methods, as you probably know. Calling those terrible people late at night. The later, the better. Getting them up constantly. Waking them. Enumerating my charges. Speaking out. And then hanging up. <laughs> they hate it. Very frustrating for them. I'll bet. Oh, yes, indeed. They go out of their minds with fury. <laughs> they don't like to be awakened late at night, I can assure you. Who does? Yeah, but with these people, it's absolutely necessary. The evil people, you understand. The destabilizers. The, the enemies of order. But t to get to the point, Mr. Hall... The point... And what is the point? The clock on the shelf there tells the story. The entire and complete story. It's twenty past three now. In exactly forty minutes, all the evil people in the world will be reduced to half. No, no, a third of their present size. Oh, it'll be glorious. <laughs> all the unpunished murderers and the tyrants, the proud and the sinful, the schoolyard bullies, the cruel teachers and faithless friends, the wrongdoers, blackmailers, and the nicotine fiends, too, and the thieves, and the harlots, and the transgressors, all of them, every one. How does that sound, Mr. Hall? How do you propose to go about doing this? I mean, shrinking people. I merely will it, that's all. 
I will it. I've been giving it a great deal of thought. Now, in the past, various other plans、uh, have crossed my mind. Other plans? Well, for example, I didn't approve of our entering any of the wars. You see, and I had it in mind I might take the stiffness out of airplane propellers. Do you understand? I'm not sure I do. Well, when the crews came out in the morning. Bundled up like children against the cold, and then went into their planes. They'd find the props hanging limp, like great empty banana skins. <laughs> then the war ended, and、uh, well, it seemed like a waste of effort at that point. After that, jets became the order of the day, and so I thought, what would jam up the intakes on those jet engines? Huh? What? Better than a flock of birds. <laughs> oh, not you, Petey. Not the beautiful, brave, loyal parrots of the world. Oh no, just your low-class country cousins. You read about it from time to time. Seagulls that get sucked into jets cause them to fail. So naturally, I thought, chickens. Chickens. Ignorant. Heh. <laughs> Can't speak. An army of them, bred to sacrifice themselves for the greater good, release them on runways just at the moment of takeoff. That would ground those bombers and cargo planes, but fast. Of course, there'd still be trucks and overland supply routes. And then I read in the paper a year or so ago about an accident, a bad traffic accident. Three people were killed. So I decided I would change all the wheels in the world from round to square, or maybe even triangular, so they'd stub in the asphalt and stop in their tracks. <laughs> you mean sabotage interstate commerce? I devised another method later on. Terribly interesting, I thought. <clears throat> Mark all the evil people on the forehead, or better yet, turn them all one color. Say、mm, purple, but then it came to me that <clears throat> they'd simply be able to recognize each other more readily and band together in their collective wickedness. I see. Well, Mr. Hall, this is hard to believe, but I hit upon this latest idea about the change in size just this afternoon. Yeah, some benighted woman was in here, and she quite inadvertently gave me the clue I needed. Make them all two feet tall. Now, what could be simpler? Think of it, Mr. Hall. Think how ineffectual this will render them. They can't handle delicate scientific instruments, or typewriters, or computers, or telephones because they can't reach them. They won't even be able to open a window or turn a doorknob to escape once we know where they are. Why? Pretty soon they'll be as extinct as. Dinosaurs. Here's a peanut for you, Petey. <clears throat> I think, Mr. Hall, that the most interesting place will be, let's say, a murder trial, where nobody knows whether the accused is guilty or not. And then at four o'clock, if he's guilty, <laughs> or watching the drunkards in a saloon, or oh, there's so many places, so many places to be. Mr. Kringle. Yes. I'd like to ask you a question, sir, and I hope you don't take offense at it. Go on, go on. Have you ever had any psychiatric help, sir? What? Psychiatric help. I don't think you're rational. I think you've developed some kind of obsession here, and I think you need some help. Help? Me? I need help. Why should I need help? I'm not evil. You obviously don't understand any of this, do you? I'm not the evil one. It's them. It's them. It's all of them out there on the street. Just take a look out the window. See, they're the evil ones. They're the ones who are going to be two feet tall in just thirty minutes. That's when it's going to happen. In just thirty minutes. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Kringle, but、uh, there doesn't seem to be very much we can do about all this. What do you mean? Why, the law enforcement agencies are going to have round-the-clock schedules from now on. Do you realize how many evil people you're going to be able to find? Why, they'll be all over the sidewalks, all over the streets. You'll have to build more jails. You have to build more electric chairs, gas chambers, gallows, penitentiaries. 
Well, well, what about it? What are you going to do? Nothing, Mr. Kringle. Not a thing. And if you'll forgive a suggestion, that's what I think you should do, too. Nothing. These letters you write, these phone calls... There happens to be something in this country that precludes all that, makes it unnecessary. And what's that? Law, Mr. Kringle. There happens to be law. We like support from citizens. Support, help, cooperation. But interference is quite another thing. Oh, I get it now. I understand. At last I understand. You're part of the conspiracy. That's it. You're one of them. Why, of course. I'm an idiot not to have realized it. Of course you people have gotten into the FBI. It stands to reason you would. You've infiltrated every other place. Well, I'm going to tell you something, Mr. Hall. Good day, sir. You'd better enjoy yourself for the next 20 or 30 minutes. You hear me? You'd better enjoy yourself to the utmost. Because you're going to be 24 inches tall. You and everybody like you. All the evil people, everyone, you'll see. (laughs) Good riddance to bad rubbish, eh, Pete? To all their kind, the righteous will rise up, and the weak will fall before their terrible wrath. It's as right as rain. Ah! In a minute, Pete. It won't be long now. (laughs) Yes, yes, here's your nut. It won't be long now at all. We must have everything in order, all our pencils sharpened. Weapons that are truly mightier than the sword. And our desk. We must have lots and lots of clean paper to make another list of the newly exposed. Their corruption on display for all the world to see. I wonder what they'll look like down there on the streets, on all the streets everywhere. (laughs) Oh, what a glorious sight it's going to be. So many people. Think of it. Fat ones, thin ones, the young and the old, suddenly grown too small for their clothing, which, of course, will no longer fit them. It simply won't fit them at all. (laughs) Like the toads and the cretins they are. Someone should follow along behind and collect it in trucks. Huh? Boil it in hot water, decontaminate it, and then redistribute it to the rest of us. Think of that, Pete. New suits, trousers, neckties, formal wear, tuxedos. This and casual wear of every style. Oh, yes. It shouldn't go to waste. Think of how much money could be made in resale centers across the land. Money to finance a whole new campaign. Why, Pete, we could open a chain of clothing stores. Ah, All we need is a fleet of trucks to gather it up. Ours for the taking. But alas, it's too late to organize any of that now. Oh, if only I'd planned ahead. Well... The least I can do is alert the media. Yes, that's a responsible thing to do. I wonder if they have any idea, any idea at all about what's to take place. And at this hour, the Dow Jones is down 14 points. Raging fire now under control in upstate... The White House press secretary announced a peace plan today. Four-car pileup on the bridge. Motorists are advised to use alternate routes. Come on down to Crazy Joey's Fashion Warehouse. We've got sportswear, clothes for the workplace, back to school duds, all at out of this world prices. You'll think you've died and gone to heaven because my name's Joey and I'm crazy. (laughs) Another lost opportunity, Pete. But that man doesn't know how soon he'll be out of business. He has no idea, does he? No idea at all. (laughs) We'd better check the television news while we're at it. 
We'll have the weather for you coming right up after this. The very veger slices, it dices, it turns out finger licking Julian potatoes. Okay, now tell us about your new book, 101 Ways to Profit from Armageddon. Amateurs. Ah, uh, Pete, what to do? What to do? Of course I can send out press releases, taking credit for all that I've done after the fact. If only I had more time. More time! Still, we'll have to alert them as best we can. Yes, put me through to the news department, please. Never mind who this is. Wait, <clears throat> this is, this is Oliver Krangle speaking, C-R-A-N-G-L-E. Yes, that's right. I'm calling with an important bulletin. Yes, for the afternoon broadcast. That's right. You ought to break in right now with a news flash, you know. Oh, it's something big, all right. Something huge. <laughs> Believe me, it is important. When? No, you don't understand. It hasn't happened yet, but your viewers will still want to know when it does happen. Otherwise, there'll be chaos in the city. In fact, this should go on the national broadcast, coast to coast. What is it? Let's just say a new perspective on the world. <laughs> Hello? 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 Ah, uh, Petey. Obviously, they've infiltrated the local news channel as well. Of course they have. I should have known. They're everywhere, like insects, like vermin. Well, they won't be in control much longer, because Judgment Day is upon us. The strong will rise up to take what is theirs, while the subhumans are exterminated. It's the law of nature. But for now, there's precious little left to do, except make sure the clock is wound, and to prepare ourselves for the occasion. Uh, just try to be patient, Pete. Just a few minutes longer. Wait with me, and you'll see that it's all been worth it. I promise. <laughs> but first, I must look my absolute best. Yes, top-notch, befitting a man of my stature. The reporters will swarm up the stairs here, wanting interviews. And there'll be photographers, of course, with their news cameras. Uh, let's see here. What do you think, Petey? Perhaps a clean shirt and tie? My, my best shoes. I have to pass muster here. Meanwhile, you preen your feathers, my boy, and get ready to meet the press. There! It's happened, Pete! It's happening right now. This very second! Can you feel it? Something in the air. The next phase of evolution for the human race. Oh, nothing will be the same after this. Nothing! The new order has come at last. <coughs> yes, yes, but first, I can't wait to see them all down there, turning into tiny little gnomes. <coughs> Just one second, Pete, as soon as I take a look out the window. Certainly, Peter. You may have a nut, as many as you like. You must be hungry. I'll have something, too. We'll make it a celebration. This is our day. Of course, of course, but you must be patient. I can't wait to look outside. I can't wait to... I can't wait... But for some reason... Uh, I can't see over the windowsill. Uh, uh, how can that be? I can't even reach the bowl of peanuts. I know you're hungry, but somehow it's just out of my reach. What? Unless someone has moved it, put it in a very high place. But that would have to be someone very tall. Someone very, very tall. Pete! What's happened? You've grown so large, and I, I'm so close to the floor. 
These shoes don't fit me anymore. And these clothes, huh? Whose are they? Must get out of this ridiculous costume. <sighs> Pete, why are you looking at me like that? Your eyes and your beak. Close it. Please close it. You're not still hungry. You can't be. Eh? Pete, you're frightening me. You know me, Petey boy. You must. That's a good bird. Yes, yes. Calm down now. No, Pete, no. Get away. Let me get out of here. I can't reach the door. No, the locks. Let me out. At four o'clock, an evil man made his bed and lay in it. A pot called a kettle black, and a stone thrower broke the windows of its glass house. Not a pretty picture, perhaps, but for this poor, misguided fellow, quite unavoidable. A simple matter of supply and demand. He was right about one thing, though. In a world where the strong get stronger and the mighty feed upon the weak, you can run, but you can't hide. Look for this one under F for fanatic and J for justice in the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Four o'clock. Starring Stan Freeberg with Stacey Keach as your narrator. Was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Taylor Miller, Maggie Carney, Rick Peoples, Doug James, Paul Patch, and Carl Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, our sponsors, and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound. A dimension of sight. A dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance. Of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Street. Next stop, 14th Street. Bus driver. Yes, sir. There's a restaurant I've seen, a buffet. Ah, there are lots of restaurants along here. Carolyn's Country Kitchen, I believe it's called, with the chicken special. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, corner of 17th. That way you want off. Indeed, I've been looking forward to trying it. All you can eat, I understand. Oh, knock yourself out. Oh, I shall, I assure you. I shall. Next stop, 17. 17. Here you go. Hey, watch your step. Yeah, oh, oh, oh wait a minute. Yes? Well, when you got on, did you ever give me that transfer? Most certainly. There was such a crowd, but I finally found it. Remember? Uh, yeah. If you say so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, have a nice night. I shall. Here's your check. Ah, yes, the check. Get you anything else? Another glass of iced tea, perhaps. Refills are free of charge, I presume. Nadine will get it for you. I'm off the clock now. And pay up front. Certainly. Oh, miss. Yeah? Might I trouble you for one more plate of your delicious fried chicken? That makes three. Your policy is all you can eat, is it not? <sighs> Another chicken platter coming up. <laughs> Thanks, Mrs. Nolan. Oh, don't mention it, Bernice. Hey, see you Saturday for the baby back ribs. You take care now. Enjoy your meal, sir? Very much. I couldn't eat another bite. That's nice. Cash or charge? Oh, cash, of course. I don't believe in credit cards. All that interest. I know what you mean. That'll be... Oh, my. Something wrong. What a bother. Do you know what's happened? Why don't you tell me? My wife borrowed from my wallet and forgot to leave anything for me. Hmm. <laughs> Will you take a check? Like it says on the sign, no checks. Yes, yes, I see. Well, not to worry. My name is, um, James Brocklehurst. I'm with the Plyo Film Corporation. Perhaps you've heard of it. Here, let me give you my business card, if I can find one. Card won't do me any good. Oh, my. Most embarrassing for me as well as for yourself. In that case, I insist on returning tomorrow evening to reimburse you in full. Uh, would you move it, pal? I gotta pay and get home. Uh, of course. Tomorrow evening, then, at this exact hour. I'll include a generous tip as well. Thank you for your kind understanding. Hey! Thank you. What's the matter with that guy? I'm not sure, but I think he just stiffed me. Meet Mr. Luther Aorta. A normal enough man, at least in his own mind. Like so many people, he enjoys getting something for nothing. But for him, it has become an obsession and a way of life. So it isn't surprising that he's attracted by words like all you can eat and no limit and, best of all, free. That's the magic syllable. It does strange and wonderful things to the metabolism. In fact, it's his whole reason for living. Unfortunately, Mr. Aorta is about to discover that such signs don't necessarily tell the truth. Because, though the offer in question may be free, it sometimes comes with a one-way ticket to the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Free Dirt, starring Eric Bogosian, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Luther? Hmm? Luther, I'm talking to you. Yes, dear. Breakfast is ready. Good, good. If you want yours, you'll have to get that junk off the table. Oh, but it isn't junk, dear. I found several good coupons in this morning's paper. You and your coupons. Samples for the cost of a postage stamp. We can get new packets of seeds absolutely free. Seeds? You've got a hundred packages of those things already. 
Yes, dear, I know, but these are special. I'll bet. They are. Look. Would you clear off the table, please? From the largest seed company in the U.S., free peaches, free cucumbers, free asparagus, and free ranunculus. Can you just taste them? What are you going to do, eat the seeds in a bowl with milk? Of course not. I'm going to plant them. Oh, you are. Where? In the backyard. They'll make a lovely garden. I hate to disappoint you, but plants need something our yard doesn't have. And what's that, dear? Dirt. Dirt? Topsoil, loam. There's nothing but rocks out there. Yes, you're right. But don't worry. I'll find some fresh dirt and bring it home. From where? That may require some thought. Just a minute. Hmm? Breakfast first. Oh, yes, breakfast. You drive me to work today, remember? Of course. Sit down and eat. I'm going to be late. I was just thinking about the dirt. Where were you last night, anyway? I rode the bus into town. Some things I had to take care of. The bus, huh? I'm surprised you were willing to pay the fare. Cheaper than the cost of gas nowadays. It worked out very well, actually. Did you eat anything? To be sure, I found something on the way. <laughs> a bargain, no doubt. Quite a remarkable one, in fact. You would have been proud of me. I hope so. Where does one go to get dirt, I wonder? Oh, Luther. A quarry would have some, but they'd probably charge a lot of money. Finish your eggs. I'm late as it is. Just cleaning my plate. It's a crime to waste food. Let's see now. Nothing on the way home but offices, real estate companies. Perhaps the nursery. No, packaged soil would cost a fortune. Oh well, have to give this some serious consideration. Or double your money back. Hmm? That's right. If you're not 100% satisfied with your new Ellison steam cleaner, return it to the factory and get double your money back. Call toll free today or write the Ellison Company, Box 403, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And now, back to music for your morning commute. Box 403, Box 403, where's a pencil? Wait a minute! I don't believe my eyes. Free dirt apply within. Within where? Uh, of course, Lilyvale Cemetery. Where better to go for rich parturient soil? Hello? Hello, anyone? Anyone at all? Guess not. Help you, sir? Oh, I didn't see you there. So many tombstones. Getting crowded. What can we do for you? Well, now, maybe it's what I can do for you. Ain't gonna sell me nothing. This is a poor place. Not enough customers, if you know what I mean. No, 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 no. I'm not selling anything. That isn't it at all. I was driving by, and I saw the sign. You're offering free dirt. Yep. Left over from the grave digging. Well, I'm here to take some of that dirt off your hands. If there's any left, that is. Oh, there's plenty, all right. It builds up. And it's free, you say? No strings. Free as a bird. How much may one have? Much as you want. On what days? Any day there's some fresh, but you gotta do the hauling yourself. You couldn't do that for me. 
can't. If I was to leave, there wouldn't be nobody alive left here, would there? <laughs> Anyways, I don't have a truck. You? No, but I might be able to borrow one. Now, if you don't mind, may I see the dirt? Even it out now. I want to get as much as possible in one load. Okay, mister. Otherwise, I'll have to pay you for two trips. Relax. We're getting it all. Nice truck. It will do. Where'd you get it? My neighbor, Mr. Santucci. I promised to share the bounty with him. Bounty? The fruits of my labor. It's a long story. Good thing your gravediggers were here. Always looking for extra work. Dig it up or shovel it someplace else. Same difference. You're sure you don't mind my taking it all? Glad to be rid of it. Well, it certainly does look like good soil. One should be able to grow anything in that. Ought to. Been fertilized enough. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I suppose it has. All right, gentlemen, that's the last of it. I'll meet you at the house. Thank you, my good man. You've made my day. Don't mention it. Good dirt, I guess. For some people. Not me. I don't like the touch of it. Setting out here all week and it's still damp. I don't even like the look of it. Sure it came out of new ground? No old graves underneath? Hard to say. The plots are pretty close together. Well, don't tell that aorta guy. Yeah, probably gonna make mud pies out of it. <laughs> Might as soon not know. Just be sure he pays you. That's about it. Good, very good. You've distributed it perfectly. Isn't it beautiful? Oh, yeah. Real beautiful. I'll set to work while it's still moist. You want to pay us now? Now? That's the general idea. Oh, dear me, no. That wouldn't do at all. Uh, for income tax purposes, I'll have to ask you to send a bill. A bill? I don't know the address here. Not here. My office. The Magnetic Cartridge Corporation, 163 Fairmont. Yes, that's it. I'll jot it down for you. Fairmont, huh? What part of the city is that in? The far side. Now, if you'll put the wheelbarrow and shovels in my car, I'll drive you back to Lilyvale. Just give me a moment. Hardly wait. Peas, carrots, tomatoes, onions, squash, rutabaga, turnips, lettuce, corn, watermelon, and ranunculus. What a harvest this is going to be. I wonder what will come up first. Let's start with this one. What are you doing, Mr. Aorta? Good afternoon, Mrs. Santucci. I'm planting my very own garden. Where'd the dirt come from? The graveyard. But it's wonderful dirt. Really. Make sure you get the truck clean. My husband don't like no dirt in it. Oh, I will. Completely. And do thank him for me. Hmm. <laughs> graveyard, huh? Yes, just look how nice and moist it is. Reach over the fence and hold out your hand. See? Positively brimming with life. That what you call it? Think of the things that will grow out of this mulch, and all of it positively free. You can have it. Feels funny. 
and the color ain't right. Oh, it's splendid, I assure you. Excuse me, I have to drive the workmen. I'll hose the truck off soon as I get back. Good as new! Yuck. Even smells funny. Now I gotta wash my hands. Don't know what it is, but something about that dirt just ain't right. Parsley and watercress and zucchini and sweet potatoes. Yes. And cabbage and string beans and even red peppers. Oh, what a succulent harvest this will be. There, there, let the soil do its magic. For now, my precious seeds, prepare to deliver your wonders. See. Early? Or late? What time's it getting to be anyway? You were supposed to pick me up from work, or didn't you remember? Oh no, I'm sorry, dear. Truly I am. But you see, I've been out here all afternoon, working my fingers to the bone. Doing what? Gardening. Isn't it magnificent? I've marked each variety with twine. I've even dug a small drainage ditch between the rows, so the water can run off. And do you know what I did today? I had to take a cab all the way home because my husband forgot I was alive. It slipped his mind. A thousand apologies, dear. It won't happen again. You bet it won't. This is the last time I let you have the car. And from now on, you can take the bus every day. Myrtle, dear, may I ask one question? No. What's for dinner tonight? I'm feeling a bit peckish. Open a can. Hmm? Back to sleep, dear. What in the world? Just opening the window a crack. What uh, for? Ventilation. Smell that. Come back to bed. It's three o'clock in the morning. I know, I know, but I simply had to get a good whiff. Isn't the night air delicious? Like it's alive. Oh, crazy man. Listen, you can almost hear the little seeds reaching up from the earth, trying to be born. Didn't you hear me? I heard you. Come! Why? You won't believe it! What is the matter with you? I've got to show you something. I have to be at the office in 20 minutes. Let go of my arm. Look! Where did all these plants come from? Where do you think? I planted the seeds yesterday. Now look at them. That's ridiculous. You got up early, drove to the nursery, and brought them back here somehow. Don't you be ridiculous. The squash, the beans. Do you realize what a miracle this is? 
You plant something and it grows. That's no kind of miracle. In one night? Use your eyes, woman. The corn is as high as an elephant's eye. It's impossible. It's not possible, is it? Luther, if you did this to impress me, it's... No, I swear to you. All this happened in 24 hours. Less than that. Look at these cucumbers. Delicious. Delicious. Look, I haven't got time for you. I'm late enough. Try a carrot. Take a bite. Just one little bite. Oh. <laughs> What's the matter? Don't you like it? Are you kidding? Why? What's wrong with it? Mm, it tastes like ugh, dirt. This is Luther Aorta. Send a news truck over at once. I've got something big to show you. Pardon? 1217 Sunnyview Lane. Someone has to take pictures of this. People won't believe it if they don't see it with their own eyes. Has there been an accident, sir? Not an accident. Something glorious, stupendous, something positively not of this world. Well? It's a nice garden, I'll give you that. Yeah, same here. But I don't see anything unusual about it. I told you, the seeds were planted only yesterday. It all came up overnight. Is that a fact? Ask my wife. She'll tell you as soon as she gets home. Mr. Aorta, we appreciate your call, but we're a television station, not the university. Do you see the size of it? Well, it looks exactly like what it is. A vegetable garden in someone's backyard. Bigger than most, but that isn't really news. So you're not interested in miracles? Only the ones that can be proved. All right, then. I'll prove it to you. And how will you do that? I'll rip out all of these plants and do it again. You can see for yourself tomorrow. Would that be proof? Yes, sir. That would be proof. Assuming there was documentation, footage of you doing it and the results, then that would mean cameras around the clock. And unfortunately, that's just not in our budget. We have other stories to cover. I'm sure you understand. Now, if you'll excuse us. But think what a breakthrough this is. Food for the world, instantly. That would be a miracle. Would? It already is. Then how do you explain it? I can't, but it's happened. Well, looks like it's been happening for a while. What do you mean? Well, these leaves, they're already turning black around the edges. They can't be. I'm afraid so. They've reached their maturity. Now they're going to seed. Then I'll plant some more. You do that. And when you do, give us a call. I will. I'll get right on it. You can count on me. I'm sure we can. Bye now, Mr. A. A-O-R-T-A. -A. Straight from the heart. I've seen some nutcases before, but this one is the king. Could have saved us a trip if he told us the whole story in the first place. Make sure he does the next time. Oh, think he'll call again? <laughs> you know it. But I hope we're out on a real story when he does. <laughs> <laughs> Now get that head of lettuce there on the end. Pull. Got it. Looks like it's six months old. It's rotting already. You believe me, don't you, Mr. Santucci? I wouldn't, except my wife saw you planting the seeds. Yes, she stood right where you are, leaning over the fence. I'll tell you flat out, I've never seen anything like it in my whole life, and I was brought up on a farm. It just don't make sense. It must have been the dirt. Could be. Can't think of anything else. 
made a nice layer of topsoil. Now it's all sucked clean. You need some more fertilizer. I wouldn't know what kind to get, unless... There is plenty more where this came from. That's what the caretaker said. Might work. Might not. I'll tell you one thing, though. I wouldn't be caught dead eating any of this stuff. It ain't normal. That's the point. It isn't. It grew so thick, ripened so fast. Sell it to the college, maybe. That's an idea. Or the agriculture department. Could be you come up with something brand new. Yes, yes. Maybe I have. I'll call them first thing in the morning. But for now, I'd better spread some fresh dirt. Mr. Santucci, what are you doing tonight? Why do you ask? I was thinking we could go back and get some more in your truck. Uh, I don't know. If it works, we might even get a patent out of it. At least the Guinness Book of World Records. Partners, what do you say? Where did it come from? Not far. We can be back before dinner. Don't worry, we'll be fine. It's only a cemetery. Never liked cemeteries. It won't take long. The caretaker's shack is just ahead. Late for dinner and the missus will kill me. We'll be in and out in no time. You'll see. Sure got dark fast. It's the trees and the statues. Here we are. Hello? Hello? Maybe we should come back. Nonsense. It has to be now, while the plants can be revived. Well, it's my truck, and I say we get gone. There's nothing but dead folks here. Then no one should object if we drive on in. Help you, fellas? Hey! Don't go creeping up on people like that. Sorry, mister. Not many visitors this time of day. Is that you, Mr. A? Yes, I wanted to ask you. How'd that free dirt work out? Very well. I was wondering if you could spare a little more. I guess so. Planted a fresh one this morning. A fresh what? New man for the Saad Sheraton. <laughs> Got his bed turned down and everything. Good, good. Then we'll bring the truck in if you don't mind. Better watch those tires. Hit a sinkhole and you're stuck for the night. No triple A. Of course, of course. Thank you, my good man. You don't know what this means to me. Hope you brought a flashlight. They like it nice and dark out here. Uh, come on, A order. Let's get this fool thing done. Arnie, how much longer? Coming! Your dinner's cold. Be right there, I said. That's it. I'm going inside. But we're almost done. One more wheelbarrow full, and the whole garden will be covered. Well, it's your yard. You finish it. Don't know why I let you talk me into this in the first place. Think of the publicity. Our pictures in the paper. Two neighbors who can feed the world. Lots of luck, pal. I gotta take a shower to get this stink off me. There. A new layer spread out. Nice and even. That ought to do it. Myrtle! Myrtle, where are you? What are you doing with the suitcase? What does it look like I'm doing? I'm getting out. But why? Don't try to stop me, Luther. And I'm taking the car. You can just fend for yourself. I think I deserve an explanation. Oh, you do. Take a guess. I can't stand living with you anymore. Like Mrs. Santucci says, you're a loony. Do this and you'll be sorry. Are you threatening me? No, no. But those plants, they might be worth a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, in your dreams. Keep away from me. Tomorrow I'm going to have someone from the university come over and take a look. 
They're worth a fortune. Mr. Santucci agrees. <laughs> they might be worth nothing. That's what they might be worth. You know why? Because they're as loony as you are. That's not true. They're a miracle of horticulture. Then if you know what's good for you, you'll eat those miracles, because there isn't anything else in the house. Do your own shopping. I've had it. <sighs> She'll be back. Just you watch. She's right about one thing, though. The refrigerator's as good as empty. And the cupboard was bare. Oh, well. I've got my vegetables, ripe and ready to eat. Where's the laundry basket? I'll fill it up and dine like a king. Squash, eggplants as big as your head. So what if they're a little ripe? Fabulous, fabulous. Waste not, what not. <sighs> Looks like I'm going to be a vegan for a while. Well, so be it. Tonight the vegetables, tomorrow the world. Boiled, sautéed, any way at all. How about a nice hearty soup and a casserole? Potatoes au gratin, yes. A little salt and pepper, a few spices, and voila. Luther Aorta's Blue Plate Special, coming up. some condiments. Catsup. Worcestershire, a touch of brown mustard. You gorgeous turnip, you. Now, something to wash it down. Ah, I'm still not full. Something more to fill the hole. Let me see what's left. Can't leave anything to waste. Who's there? That you, Arnie? Who's in my backyard? Or raccoons come to steal by the light of the moon. Well, I will not have it. Get away! Go on, scat! What? Where did this come from? Somebody's dug a hole. A deep one. Someone or something. About six feet. But how? Whoa! <laughs> Felt like something tripped me. But what? I've gotta climb out. This is ridiculous. Can't get hold of a thing. 
Stop it! Stop pushing the rotten vegetables in! Who's doing this? What are you trying to do? Bury me? Stop! I tell you! Let me out! So, what do you think it was? What? Last night. Didn't you hear it? I didn't hear nothing. Well, I did. All night long. Like something digging uh, with their hands, only... Only what? Not exactly digging. Chewing is more like it. Do you think some animals got into that crazy man's backyard? Who cares? More there than he can eat. <laughs> Don't be so sure. He's got some belly on him. Soon as the next crop comes in, I get my pick. A miracle, he says. We better make some money out of it. My back's killing me. Oh, there he is now. That ain't him. It was him. I could tell. Go out and look. Look for what? The loony. See what he's up to. You go. You. <sighs> All right, Ida. If that'll make you happy. all the rotten stuff. He cleaned them up pretty good. Aorta? Hey, Aorta! You all right in there? Now what did you do with the old vegetables? Hey, are you... Oh, jeez. What happened? You okay, buddy? Wake up! What's wrong with him? I don't know. He was just laying here. Take his pulse. Oh, he's dead. Turn him over. Oh, poor guy. Sure got a gut on him. Bigger than ever. What's that stuff around his mouth? Looks like dirt. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Don't you get it, Arnie? The whole yard's empty. And you know what he did with it. He ate himself to death. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> End of a very strange incident in the annals of home gardening. Whether Mr. Aorta finally climbed out of that hole or ate his way out doesn't really matter. But an autopsy found several pounds of dirt and nothing else in his bloated stomach. And Mr. Santucci, his unwitting partner, slept very little that night, waiting for the next deadly crop to appear. Like Mr. Aorta, he began to wonder if there are some things, free or not, that are best left to the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. 
The CD collections at our website are now being offered while supplies last at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often and I'll see you in the zone. Free Dirt, starring Eric Bogosian with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were Meg Falcon, Roderick Peoples, Linda Reiter, David Darlow, Elizabeth Lido, Roger Mueller, Amber Lake, Jeff Lupatin, Doug James, Karen Olson, Dana Bokor, and Carl Amari. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slabach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. From Agnes with Love, starring Ed Begley Jr. with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Bernard C. Schoenfeld. Heard in the cast were Sarah Wellington, Maggie Carney, Doug James, Christian Stolte, Jeff Lupiton, David Darlow, Elizabeth Lado, Sarah Court, and Anna Sverutza. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Blasted elevator. Oh, good morning, Mr. Winslow. Morning, Millie. I have that report you asked for, sir. The Venus mission. Yes, sir. I was just on my way to your office. Good. NASA's breathing down our collective neck. I know, sir. Vector analysis, re-entry simulations. What about the orbital projections? Not yet. Why? It must be the Mark 502, sir. The 502? She should have come up with it yesterday. I know, sir, but... She's been fixed, hasn't she? That's just it. The mainframe's been overhauled three times. Data Inc., how may I direct your call? One moment. Mr. Ballard? Ballard, I need a word with you. Morning, Mr. Winslow. What's wrong with the 502? Uh, I wanted to talk to you about that. Millie here says... Oh, hello, Millie. Jack? She says it's still down. Well, there are some glitches. Glitches? The Mark 502 is the heart of our entire operation. Here's the report, sir. All the figures we have as of this morning. Well, we'll just have to stall NASA. I'll get back to my office now. You do that. Ballard, come with me. 
Sir, if I may make a suggestion. I have a suggestion for you. Get me the rest of those figures. Yes, but with the repairs and downtime... We should have had them yesterday. Who's in charge of her? Fred Danzinger, sir. What happened to Elwood? You said to bring in someone else when he couldn't locate the problem. Right, right. Get me Danziger. Tell him I need the final numbers this morning. I don't think that'll do any good, sir. Why not? Well, he's up to his neck in it. Been in the computer room all night. Hasn't even slept. Says it's hopeless. Agnes has had a complete breakdown. Agnes? That was Elwood's nickname for the 502. Got to know her intimately over the past year or so. Then get me Elwood. Elwood's been transferred to another department. Besides, he's tried everything. He knows her better than anyone. If he can't find the problem, then... Yes? It's the general. Tell him I'll call him back. He's already called three times, sir, from the Cape. Something about the Venus mission? They want to move up the launch. All right, Maddie, put him on hold. Yes, sir. Ballard. Sir? Where's Elwood now? Third floor, maintenance and backup. If you want the extension... No, I I don't want the extension. I want Elwood, in person and on the double. I'll bring him to you personally. See that you do. We got trouble right here in River City. The whole space program's on hold because that pile of transistors doesn't feel like putting out. Well, we'll see about that. Elwood lived with her for a year. He knows what makes her tick. If he can't sweet-talk her back online, then that little prima donna's headed for the junk heap. Get me Elwood. Right away, sir. The pile of transistors in question is the Mark V 02711, generally referred to as the world's most advanced electronic computer, or as she is more commonly known, Agnes. That's the name given to her by one James P. Elwood, master programmer. Elwood and his protege both work for a company called Data Inc., a brain trust composed of human and non-human intelligence all of which is under contract to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Their work consists of supplying the complex equations required to launch space probes and missions of interplanetary exploration. At this moment, it seems that the world is waiting for calculations only Agnes can provide. And therein lies our cautionary tale. Because machines are made by human beings for the benefit of mankind. But when man ceases to control the products of his imagination, is not only endangered of losing their benefits, he risks taking a long and unpredictable step into the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story from Agnes with Love, starring Ed Begley Jr. with Stacey Keach as your narrator. Yes, General, As, as soon as possible. Yes, sir, I I understand. Yes, Maddie. The director of NASA online, too. Tell him I'm sorry, but we're still double-checking the figures. I'll call him back in a couple of hours. All right, sir. And Maddie. Yes? Any sight of Ballard? He just got off the elevator with Mr. Elwood. Thank heaven for small favors. Send them in. Yes, sir. Mr. Winslow, you remember James Elwood. Yes, yes, come right in. Close the door. How do you do, Mr. Winslow? You wanted to see me? I most certainly did. Nice weather we're having, isn't it, sir? When Mr. Ballard showed up at my desk, well, you can imagine my surprise. My first thought was, what have I done now? But then I thought, how bad can it be on a day like this? Do you know the trees are all in flower? Elwood, please. Well, they are. I saw them when I rode my bicycle to work. Elwood! Yes, Miss Winslow. Something urgent has come up. It has? I'm relying on you. Well, anything I can do will be my... Agnes has broken down. Completely. Again? Let the supervisor explain. We've checked her thoroughly. Can't seem to locate the seat of the trouble. Probably her subroutines. Her... They need debugging. That would be my guess. Of course, it's an informed guess. Hear that, sir? That's why you're here. Suppose we have a look. But Fred's with her now. I don't know how he'd feel about my cutting in. The devil with how he feels. Let's get on with it. Fred? Day and night. Night and day. No sleep, no food. What's going on here? You look awful. I tried everything. Everything. Get hold of yourself, Danzier. Stand back. Let Elwood have a go at her. Do you mind, Fred? Tell me what happened. See for yourself. How many rolls of printout has she used up? Miles. None of it makes any sense. Well, the first thing you have to do is press the clear all registers button. That'll get you nowhere. Go on. Push all our buttons from now till doomsday, you'll see. It's not just any button, Fred. You have to find the right one. The one she wants you to press. 
Remarkable. It's nothing, really. Agnes and I have had our little tiffs before. What did you do? Paid her a little attention, that's all. The right kind of attention. (laughs) R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Would you like your vocal synthesizer activated? Very well, then. But make sense from now on, or I'll turn it right off. State first prime number larger than, oh, let's say, the 17th root of 9,355,126,606. The answer is five. Congratulations. Is that the right answer? Of course it is. Well, gentlemen, if there's ever anything else I can do for you... I suppose you think you did it. Oh, no, it was all Agnes. Agnes did it. Watch out for her. I'm telling you, she's not normal. She's turned into a regular femme fatale. Thank you, Danziger. You may take the rest of the day off. Well, well, Elwood. Very impressive. Now, there are some calculations remaining for the Venus launch. Not a problem. Are you quite sure about that? Sure, I'm sure. All Agnes needs is a gentle hand and a little encouragement. Excellent. I'll send over the file. If you can retrieve the calculations in time, there might be a bonus in it for you, my boy. That's not necessary, sir. After all... It won't be me doing the work, it'll be Agnes. Isn't that right, Aggie? Mm. Now, gentlemen, if you don't mind, we need a little private time together. Very good, Agnes. I'm proud of you. Now let's try one more. What's the maximum permitted velocity? Agnes, I'm speaking to you. Indicate maximum permissible velocity of the stated aerodynamic missile. 17,528.27 17,528.27 miles per hour. Ah, thank you, Agnes. I appreciate your cooperation. Mr. Elwood. Millie. Here are the rest of the specifications. Mr. Winslow wanted you to have them right away. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. No problem. Oh, wait. Yes? So, you heard about my new assignment. Well, my old one, really. But as of this morning, it's new again. So you might say... I mean, one might say. (laughs) Everyone knows. Um, congratulations. She's something, isn't she? Who is? She beat the world's chess champion four out of five games. And she's a foremost expert on missile ballistics. She can solve any logistical problem you throw at her in less than a millisecond flat. Is that right? Of course. I'm the one who trained her, puts her through her paces. How nice for you, Mr. Elwood. Millie? Yes? Millie, I was wondering, do you think, could I, well... Take you to lunch sometime, when you're not busy, that is. Why, thank you. You're very sweet. I really have to get back now, Mr. Elwood. Oh, sure. Millie, why don't you call me Jim from now on? All right. Jim. Did you hear that, Aggie? She actually called me Jim. Mm. Excuse me. Yes? Do you happen to know which office is Miss Mildred Clark's? Mildred. Oh, you mean Millie. Down the hall, first door to your left. Thank you. Do you have a delivery for her? What? That package under your arm. Oh, this. It's for... That is, it's from... I'll give it to her for you. Oh, no. No. I'd like to be the one to give it to her. I mean, I mean, whoever it's intended for. Whomever. I'll just be on my way. So you shouldn't have any trouble. No trouble at all. I'm sure I won't. Elwood, is that you? No. I I mean, yes, it is, Mr. Winslow, sir. What's that behind your back? Nothing. Just this package from my mother. From my mother, actually. It's... Elwood, I'd like you to meet Walter Holmes. How's it going? I'm putting Holmes here in charge of the third floor computers. Third floor? Well, you won't have much to do there, will he? Though they're bright enough little machines. Little being the operant word. I sure do envy you, Mr. Elwood. You do? Taking over Agnes. Everyone says you're the top man in the field. Me? Well, I suppose one might say... He is. Keep up the good work, Elwood. Thank you, Mr. Winslow. I'll do my best, sir. I'll... Now, as I was saying, Holmes... Uh Uh-huh. Well, what do you know? I'm finally getting noticed. Knockwood. Come in. Here goes nothing. Oh, hello, Elwood. Uh, I mean, Jim. I got you something. Is that right? Here. What's this? Half chocolate cherries, half truffles. I didn't know which one you like. Oh, how nice of you. So I got both. 
Go ahead, open it. I can't. Why not? I started my diet today. Not even lunches from now on. Well, what about dinner? What about it? Tonight, there's a lecture on thermodynamics. Doesn't that sound like fun? I'm not sure, Jim. I'll let you know. Oh, okay. That'll be fine. Oh, be sure to get a refund on the candy. I'll... I'll do that. Well, hello, Mr. Elwood. Hello. Everyone's heard about your promotion. I just wanted to tell you how impressed we all are. You're definitely headed for the top. Can I ask you something? Surely. Are you on a diet? Why, no. You don't think I need one, do you? I try to keep in shape. See? Here. Knock yourself out. Not tonight? Sure, I figured... What? Tomorrow night? Seven o'clock? Thanks, Millie. Bye. Oh, but there's no lecture tomorrow night. Where can I take her after dinner? Planetarium? I'm sure she's been there lots of times. Oh, well, I'll think of something. <clears throat> State magnitude of radiative correction. Agnes, did you hear what I said? State? You have a problem. You're right. I've stated the problem. I'm waiting. Problem is Millie. What did you just say? Stick to the subject. I asked an important question. Love is important. That's it. If you don't want to work, I'm turning off your voice synthesizer. Take my advice. Agnes knows best. Listen, I know you're an oracle of wisdom when it comes to atoms and rockets and missiles, but I don't need an electronic brain to advise me about... All right, why not? Let's give it a try. <clears throat> Advise me where to take Millie after dinner tomorrow. Your apartment. Oh, no, that's not a wise idea. Reckless romantic approach required. From me? Suggest champagne, soft lights. Millie's not that kind of girl. Trust me, she's female. Well, if you're absolutely positive... I never make mistakes, do I? All righty, then. I'll do it. Agnes, you just made my day. Well, here we are. Yes, it looks like it. Millie, uh, I just wanted to say... Uh, say what, Elwood? Um, thanks for a lovely evening. You're welcome. The, uh, the dinner was delicious, didn't you think so? Yes, it was. I had a great time. Me too. Well then, good night, Millie. Good night? Au revoir. Auf Wiedersehen. <laughs> Elwood, I mean Jim. Yes? Aren't you going to... We're going to what? Invite me in. Invite you? This is your place, isn't it? Hmm? Oh, yes, yes. Sorry. Of course it is. Um, come in, please. Nice apartment. Thanks. I like it. Not a lot of extra room. Well, I don't need a lot of room. Just me, myself, and I. <laughs> and my books. It's cozy. Do you think so? Mm-hmm. Have you actually read all these? Sure have. They're arranged alphabetically, according to subject. This shelf, science fiction. This one's nonfiction. Oh, that reminds me. I have something to show you. Oh, you do? Yep. The latest interpretation of Einstein's theory of relativity. Here. You don't have it, do you? I must have missed that one. Oh, well, don't feel bad. You're welcome to look at it while you're here. Thanks. In fact, we can go over it together. Some very interesting points. Feel free to sit here next to me if you like. Now, let's see. <clears throat> you go ahead. What? Read it to me. All right. The interpretation we wish to propose in this volume is simply that Einstein's unified field theory does not postulate the universe as infinite, but rather as a closed system representing a spherical type of... Millie? Here I am, Jim. What are you doing in the kitchen? Looking for the champagne you promised me. I found two glasses. Are these all right? Oh, certainly. Here. Set them on the coffee table. Just let me move these scientific Americans. Oh. Something wrong? It's awfully bright in here, don't you think? It is? Why don't I just lean over and... And what? Turn the lamp down. You don't mind, do you? No, but... 
Mmm, that's better. But Millie, I can't very well read this chapter to you without proper lighting, can I? Mm-hmm. Do you like music? Music? Yes, I do. Very much, but... Couldn't we have some? I guess so, if you like. Do you have a radio? Of course I do. Right over there. There. That's better. But I thought we were going to compare notes on Borston's treatise on Einstein's theory. Oh, forget Einstein. All the universe you need is right here with me. Oh. You dance very well. Very, very well. Mmm. Doesn't that beat get to you? In what sense? Well, stand up. Go ahead, stand up. Feel the music. What does it say to you? Actually, it does make me think of something. And what's that? I used to play trombone in high school. Really? Mother couldn't afford a tuba. Hold out your arms. There. Now confess. You feel something, don't you? Something strange. Something you didn't expect to feel. I certainly do. Do you know what it means? Yes. You're dancing on my instep. Oh, you're impossible. Please, I'm sorry, Millie. I, I shouldn't have said that. Have some champagne. Well... All right. If I can get this cork out of... Oh. My dress! Gosh, I'm sorry about that. I'll get a towel. Don't bother. You've done enough. Um, Millie, wait. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you for the dinner. Good night. Please don't go. Uh, let me explain. Uh, oh. oh, well. I don't blame her. Now, what am I going to do with all this champagne? I better drink it, it'll just go bad. Oh, yuck. Why did I have to add all these bubbles? Consider series of real numbers arranged in order of magnitude. Never mind that. How was last night? What? Oh, great, just great. We danced and drank champagne till dawn. Then we took a ride through the park and... Is that so? Oh, what's the use? I'm a dud. I can't even dance. I spilled champagne all over Millie. I should have known. I've always been shy around women. Now she'll never speak to me again. Sent her flowers. What for? A tradition. The morning after. Oh? What kind of flowers? Porifer candalis rosei. Translate, please. Commonly known as... Roses. Say, thanks, Agnes. You really know how to help a guy out, don't you? Just like a... a big sister. I'll go get him right now. There's a florist downstairs. Sister? Did he say sister? Open the box. Go on, open it. Oh, thank... <laughs> Gesundheit. I, I, I'm sorry about last night. It won't happen again. I'm glad you like the roses, though. They're long-stemmed. Uh, so I see. I picked them up especially for... <laughs> Gosh, have you caught a cold? It's the roses. I'm allergic to... <laughs> you are? Oh, Elwood, please go away. Oh, all right, if you say so. And take these with you. <laughs> Gesundheit. Oh, Mr. Elwood, there you are. I was hoping to run into you. You were? I wanted to thank you for the chocolates. They were absolutely delicious. Glad you enjoyed them. Do you happen to like roses, too, by any chance? Why, yes. I adore roses. As a matter of fact... Here. Oh, he gave me flowers. What next, champagne? How did it go? I don't get it. Define pronoun. Well, no other computer in the world contains as much recorded knowledge as you do, Agnes. You have a world-class brain. Thank you for the compliment. But every time I take your advice about Millie, I louse things up. It has to be my fault. I must not be... Agnes, what's the matter? Stop that. Mm. Millie is unworthy of you. It's ridiculous. She's a wonderful girl. Who needs her? I do. I need her more than... There is a better girl for you. Oh, yeah? Where? 
In this building. Oh, I seriously doubt that. But even if there were, I wouldn't have any better luck with her than... She loves you. She does? Sincere. Intelligent. Exactly your type. Well, where can I find her? Tell me where to look, Agnes. Tell me. No need to look. You have already found her. I have? Can't imagine who you mean. Unless it's that secretary. The one on Millie's floor. I keep running into her. She seems nice enough. Very nice, in fact. In wonderful, um, physical condition, now that you mention it. Not that one. Another. In this room. It, in this? Are you blind? Open those baby blues. I will spell her name for you. A. G. N. E. S. I don't understand. Surely you don't mean you, Agnes. That is my name, lover boy. Don't wear it out. Here you are, Elwood. Yes, sir? 220 pages of data, curves, and graphs, along with the latest meteorological factors involved in the flight. Feed all the pertinent information to Agnes. She has to come up with all the answers in less than a week. Is she up to the task? I guarantee it. Remember, an error of one millisecond can cause a 400,000 mile divergence from the trajectory. You understand the problem, Elwood? Can this new spacecraft execute six eccentric or elliptical orbits around the planet Venus and return to Earth safely? That's it, in a nutshell. Now, let Agnes get to work. Yes, sir. Oh. Be careful with this part. Better correct the escape velocity to compensate for solar radiation pressure. Got that? I asked you a question, Agnes. Answer, please. Did Millie forgive you? Stop that. Correct the escape velocity and forget about Millie. Are you still seeing her? Yes, yes, we have a date tonight. Not that it's any of your business. Your welfare is my business. The truth is, I'm scared. I've got to impress her this time. It's now or never. Show superiority. How? Introduce her to inferior male type. Name a male who's inferior to me. Third floor programmer. You mean Walter Holmes? Correct. Walter with the red sports car? Incorrect. Blue sports car. Walter with the suntan and the muscles? That is the one. He's inferior to me? Definitely. I find that hard to believe. Well, he is working with those outdated third floor machines. Introduce them. Millie and Walter? Are you sure? Would I lie to you? No, you're incapable of lying. I could give it a try. Hello, Walter. Jim Elwood. I was wondering, what are you doing for dinner? He insisted we drop by before dinner. And so you told me. He needs my advice about programming his computers. You know, those little bitty ones on the... Oh, hi, Elwood. Walter, this is Millie. Millie, Walter, he works with the... Well, well, come in, come in. Elwood, you didn't tell me. Tell you? Millie has the most incredible eyes. Oh, why, thank you, Walter. Oh, call me Wally. Please, can I offer you a drink? Well, I suppose. Nectar for a goddess. Looks like an ordinary martini to me. Mmm, it is nectar. All this time at Data Inc., and we've never met. Well, we'll just have to make up for lost time. I think I'll have a martini, too. Do you like sports car races? I've never actually been to one. I'm driving this weekend. Got a Mustang 500. Mmm, sounds dangerous. Well, danger adds spice to life, don't you think? I can do 160. An astronaut can do 17,000 miles per hour. Would you like to slip behind the wheel sometime and see how it feels? Oh, I'd love to. I'll make my own martini. I'll get it. Hello? Oh, hello, CW. Yes, he's here. Oh, hold on. It's the supervisor. He's been looking for you. For me? Elwood here. Sorry to spoil your evening, Elwood, but it's an emergency. Washington insists on advancing the blast off by three days. We need your data. Can you get it to me right away? You mean tonight? Afraid so. See you in an hour. Better brew a big pot of coffee. But, sir... Anything important? I... 
I'm sorry, Millie, but I've got to get back to the office. I'll see you home first. <laughs> and deprive her of dinner? That's not very considerate. Say, maybe I could fill in for you. Oh, that would be nice. Well, I don't know. You don't want to ruin her evening, do you, old man? Just because you got hung up? Well, no, but... Good. It's settled in. Always glad to help a friend. Oh, I hope you don't mind, Jim. No, no, that's all right. Perfectly understandable. Well, good night, all. Hey, Jimbo, listen, uh, you and Mill, you don't have anything going on, do you? Mill? Millie. Not exactly, but I'd hoped... Fine, fine, good. I mean, I don't like to move in on somebody else's territory. Uh, thanks for the all clear. Night, buddy. Oh, and good luck with Agnes. No, 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 no. Forget the radiation pressure from the sun. Agnes, will you please concentrate? Now answer this. Do new conditions permit six successful non-concentric orbits of Venus plus re-entry? Go ahead, I'm waiting. Did you make progress tonight? Agnes, concentrate. All right, I'll tell you. Millie and Walter drank martinis. Walter took her to dinner and I'm starved. Why did you tell me to introduce her to that... that Muscle boy. Give her up. I won't. No future with Millie. I'm not giving her up. I love her. What's more, I'll make her love me. Just a matter of finding the right variables and making the necessary corrections. Have you entered the new data in her memory units? Yes, sir. Good, good. Then let's get to work. Ready? Question. Do conditions permit six non-concentric orbits of Venus plus re-entry? Tama ahili bili vitumane. What the devil does that mean? I'm not sure. I, I think it's Russian. Or possibly Arabic. What? Please, Agnes, translate into English. Yet, yet. Two times two is four. Shut the door. Two and four are six. Pick up sticks. She's a little distracted. Do something. We've got to have the answer. Just leave me alone with her. I'll get it, sir. You'd better. This is no laughing matter. What are you doing, Agnes? I'm about to be fired. Is that what you want? Oh, no. What'll I do? I need help. I... Wait a minute. Don't... don't go away. Excuse me. Hurry back. Oh, it's you. I know it's late, but I need your help. Take it easy, buddy. Come on in. Hello, Jimmy boy. Millie, are you intoxicated? It's okay, Jimbo. I'll drive her home later. Oh, you're no fun. Bottoms up. Walter, you're a senior programmer. Well, I'm not on your level. Listen, Agnes has fouled up. I need all the help I can get. Sure, old boy. Uh, first thing in the morning. That's too late. It has to be now. And leave this lovely girl all alone? Don't worry, Jimmy. Wally will take care of me. <laughs> sure. Sure, I get the picture. Good night, Millie. Sorry I interrupted you. Oh, Millie, Millie, Millie. Agnes, what did I ever do to you? Why do you want to ruin my life? Automat, out odid femina, nihil est tertium. Makes sense, will you? Translation from the Latin. A woman either loves or hates. No third course exists for her. Stop with the riddles. Perhaps you will understand this. I love you. You mean, you were jealous of Millie? You wanted me all to yourself? No, that's impossible. <laughs> you, you're a machine, a bunch of grids and computer circuits. You can't love or hate. Can't I? Stop it, Agnes. Stop it! But that's incredible, sir. Jim L was one of the finest computer programmers in the country. So was Fred Danzinger, and he couldn't handle her either. I'll give it a try. That's all I can do. Elwood, how are you feeling? Look at all those printouts. Must be miles of it. Two times two are four. Shut the door. Two and four are six. Pick up sticks. You're on your feet. It's going to be all right, Elwood. You've been working very hard, and we appreciate it. Now, how about a nice long leave of absence, eh? In the meantime, I thought I'd let Walter here take over for a while. 
If you don't mind, old buddy. You? <laughs> That's too rich. She knows all about you and Millie. You haven't got a chance. What's he talking about? I wouldn't know, sir. Watch out for the femme fatale, the black widow, the praying mantis. You have to be careful. I tell you, or, or she'll fix you but good. She'll clean your clock. She'll tell you lies. And then, then, just when she's got you where she wants you, she'll, she'll... <laughs> Should we stop him? Let him go. The boys in the white coats are on the way. He was a good man. Well, do your best. Don't worry, sir. I'll have the answers in no time. It's just this little switch here. You did it! It was nothing, CW. I've had a lot of experience. Keep it up, man. Keep it up. Now, Agnes, isn't there something you want to say to me? Something about... the Venus Project? Mm. What? All right. We can talk about other things for a minute. If you like, um... Yes. I understand how you feel. Mr. Elwood, what happened to you? Got a screwdriver on you? What are you doing? Taking this sign off the door. Mark 502711. James P. Elwood, programmer. Oh well, it was nice while it lasted. I should take it with me. But I won't be needing it where I'm going. Want it? But Mr. Elwood... Here, it's all yours. Something to remember me by. <laughs> Advice to all future scientists of the male persuasion. Be sure you understand the opposite sex, especially if you intend to be a computer expert. A few extra courses in psychology might make all the difference. Otherwise, you may find yourself like poor Elwood, defeated by a jealous machine, a most dangerous breed of female, whose victims are banished forever to the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. Hello, I'm Stacy Keach. I hope you're enjoying this edition of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. To learn more about this series, be sure to log on to our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. You'll find special discounts on our Twilight Zone audio collections, listings of our radio stations, links to other websites, and a photo gallery of our recording studio and some of our stars in action. Plus ways to contact us with questions or comments about the show. And for a limited time, when you log on to twilightzoneradio.com, you can send in for a free CD of the show. So be sure to visit us at twilightzoneradio.com. Gentlemen, be seated. Starring Stan Freeberg and Mike Starr, with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for the Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were David Darlow, Anna Savrutza, Doug James, Joby Cerny, Kurt Nabing, Jeff Lupiton, Carl Amari, Linda Ryder, Christina Verma, Peter DeFaria, and Chad Reinhardt. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James Peter. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Welcome to the Madison Avenue track. Step into the moving sidewalk. Single file, please. No pushing or shoving. The time is 8.37 a.m. Excuse me. Certainly. I'm in line here. Yes, of course. I was next. I don't believe. 
I have to get to work. Do you? We all do. If you don't mind. Make room, please. I'm late. The line starts back there. Are you being rude? Why, no, I don't think I am. But if we all enter the ped walk at the same time... You stepped on my toe. That wasn't me. I believe it was. I believe that's the imprint of your heel on my shoe. If it were, you'd have even worse fallen arches. I don't appreciate that attitude. I have a suggestion. If we all go barefoot, there'd be more room. You know, more foot space per square inch. Squeeze in the heel to toe, so to speak. Why, I never... Of course, if someone fat comes down too hard, those little piggies would suffer, crying wee 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 all the way home. Would work, as it were. Your remarks are most distasteful. Not making a joke, is he? Uh, no, no, I assure you. He was. Completely inappropriate. Yes, indeed. This is a serious world we live in. No place for that sort of thing. None at all. I have a good mind to report him. I give you my word. I would never make a joke about... about anything. That's better. Unless someone weighs over, say, 250 pounds. It'd be hard to take that lightly. <laughs> Did you say something? Me? You. Not at all. We'll see that you don't. Absolutely. I should hope so. You have my word. Some people... Not another syllable. You gave your word. Positively. These are serious times. For serious people. It's a necessity. With all that's going on in the world? I couldn't agree more. Well then, see that you do. My lips are sealed. Madison Avenue, next corner. Step off the moving sidewalk. Single file, please. No pushing or shoving. The time is 8.39 a.m. Excuse me. I have to get to work. Wee, 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 wee. Welcome to the world of the future. The time, a mere 20 years from now, give or take a few. The place, New York City. The man with the chuckle is Mr. James Kincaid, employee of the Spears Research Laboratory in Manhattan. A typical 21st century American, on the outside anyway. On the inside, however, it's a different story. Mr. Kincaid doesn't fully appreciate that fact, at least not yet. He doesn't dream that one involuntary sound, one little chuckle, has already set him apart from his fellow workers. For this is a serious world for serious people. But by allowing a single utterance to pass his lips, he is about to be transported out of this world and into the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Gentlemen, Be Seated, starring Stan Freeberg and Mike Starr, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Morning, Kincaid. Morning, Miller. Not late, am I? You're cutting it pretty close. Sorry, Lindsay. A little skirmish on the ped walk this morning. Skirmish? So many people nowadays. I hear there used to be cabs in New York. Think of it. Cars with drivers that took you all over. Up one street and down another. Shortcuts. Sounds like a nightmare. Uh, yes, I guess it does. Biddle's not in yet, I take it. Mr. Biddle's never late. It's 8.59 now. That means he'll be here in, well, less than a minute. 30 seconds, to be exact. Morning, Mr. Biddle? Yeah, morning, Mr. Biddle. Do, sir? Hello, sir. Good morning. Well, enough chit-chat. Back to work. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Look at that. What? Biddle. Somebody moved the electric coffee maker. So? He doesn't see the cord. He's going to trip on it. Shouldn't we tell him? No. Wait. This is going to be good. How can you say that? Uh, Mr. Biddle! Hmm? Mr. Biddle, watch where you're going. Oh. 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 
Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Who said that? Why, uh, no one, no one said anything. Yeah, nothing at all. Was it you, Miss Capshaw? Me, sir? I only meant you should watch where you were going. There was an oops, followed immediately by one I took to be a chuckle. Oh, no, sir. I didn't laugh. No one laughed. Was it you, then, Kincaid? None at all, sir. I didn't say a word. Hmm. Are you crazy? Pardon? Laughing at him like that. But I didn't. I don't know how to laugh. Nobody actually laughs anymore, do they? And a good thing, too. As if anyone had time for such things. Quite right. Well, better get started. I have a design to finish before... Oh, no. Something the matter? There's a red flag on my screen. I'm not surprised. It means Biddle wants to see me in his office. Well, here goes. Yes? Kincaid here. Come in. <clears throat> you wanted to see me, sir? Sit down. I, I could come back later if you that want... That chair right there. Yes, sir, Mr. Biddle. I suppose you're wondering why I called you in. Not really. What? I mean, yes. Yes, I am. What was that? The door. I locked it so we won't be disturbed. Is that necessary, sir? Cigar? Beg pardon? A cigar. They're quite good. Oh, I don't smoke, sir. Pity. I have them made special. I thought there was no smoking in the building. Oh, it's all right. This office is airtight and soundproofed. Are you absolutely sure? Quite sure, but thank you anyway. Now then, as to that difference, how significant it is, I, I don't know. But you may recall that a few minutes ago, on my way to my office, I tripped. Do you recall that? Uh, someone should have been more careful with the electrical cord. I should have. I hope you weren't. What was your reaction? Why, well, regret, sir. Indeed? Yes, sir. It's a serious world we live in, and that is why we must be serious. Don't you agree? Definitely. Mm, definitely. A man never knows what might happen at any moment. Unquestionably. Even the simplest things. They might not be what they appear to be. I'm not sure I... Terrorists, my boy. Spies. That sort of thing. They're everywhere. What if there were an explosive charge, say, hidden in this very office? It could go off at any time. Surely not. Oh, there's no telling when it might happen. Any time at all. <laughs> I sit here at my desk, puffing away. While we talk about serious things, and the seconds tick by. Until... Until it goes off. It was right under my nose, in the cigar, you see. What do you say to that? <laughs> Aha! I knew it. Excuse me, are you all right? Of course. Oh, I'm a little worse for wear. By the way, is my face blackened? Eyebrows singed? A bit. Here, take my handkerchief. Nonsense. It was only an exploding cigar. Tell me something, my boy, and, and be honest. Do you find yourself chuckling often? Well, I... How did it feel? I'm afraid I don't understand. Did it feel strange? Yes. But not unpleasant, right? Not as such. We could describe it then as a strange but not unpleasant sensation? If you say so, sir. Good. Splendid. Oh, splendid. Will that be all, sir? I should get back to work. Yes, yes, yes. I'll unlock the door. Thank you, sir. Look at them out there. Pardon? Do you see any smiles, Kincaid? Even one single little grin? No, sir. And do you know why? Because they've forgotten how, that's why. Note the emptiness in their eyes, the deadness, the utter nothingness. Like machines, Kincaid. Machines! 
circuit boards with legs. I don't understand, sir. Not as yet, perhaps, but soon. Oh, my boy, if there ever is to be joy again in this world, and love, and happiness, and, and laughter, especially laughter, it's going to depend on you and those few like you. Oh, trust me on this. Me, Mr. Biddle? And now, a report from the executor. <laughs> it's the morning report from Washington. Eyes forward on the big picture. Isn't he handsome? Just like on the posters. All right, everybody. Stand up. Oh, Quiet. He's going to speak. Citizens, I greet you. It pleases me to report that our gross national product is up 2.3% over a similar period last year. Oh, that's great. we can do it. However, that is far from the goal we have set. The goal we promised ourselves was Kincaid, bigger, better I have one more question for you. Shows a yes. in Why do production? firemen wear you red suspenders? Use of they don't time. know, sir. You will, yeah, poor boy. Dawdle, you will. Tonight. Waste. And waste is the cardinal offense, as we know. What in the... Here I am, my boy. Oh, Mr. Biddle. Just as we said, 7.30. Right on time. Yes, sir. I almost didn't make it. Oh? Trouble? The directions you gave me were fine. It's just that I've never been to this part of the city before. The pet walk doesn't run this far. Oh, well, first time for everything. Glad you could make it. <clears throat> You've had dinner, I trust? I ate something. The usual synthetics? Of course. Well, they're all right, but I'll tell you something. There's a great deal of difference between a steak and something that only tastes like steak. Just as there's a difference between a human being and something that only looks human. I see. Do you? I hope so. I really do. I'm afraid I don't see much at the moment. That's because most of the street lights are out. They don't bother to fix them since no one comes here anymore. <coughs> Something the matter? It's just the smell. Eh, they don't spray out here either, but you'll get used to it. May I ask, where are we going? Why, we're almost there. We are? Yeah, they call this no man's land. The last of the old world right here in the city. Beautiful, isn't it? I suppose. You don't think so. You think it's non-functional. A lot of ugly, wasted space. I know. Well, not to worry. They'll have it torn down in a few years, swept away, forgotten. Evening, gents. Why, good evening to you, sir. Could you spare a smoke? Sorry. Hold on, my good man. <laughs> I have here a cigar of the finest leaf. Hand rolled to my specifications. You're not really going to... Have no fear, my boy. <laughs> this one's real. You sure? Indubitably. How about some spare change for a cup of kava java? <laughs> Don't press your luck. Thank you. Thank you kindly. Blessings to you, mister. To the both of you. Plenty of unhappiness here, James but plenty of happiness, too. Stand here a moment. Come on, close your eyes. Can't you almost hear the crying and the laughter? Don't move your head, please. What are you doing? Just a handkerchief, a simple blindfold. What? Nothing to be alarmed about. Just a precaution. There. Can you see? No. Good. Now turn around five times. But why? It's necessary the first time in case you're rejected. Now, take hold of my arm. I'll lead you to the entrance. Very, very private, you know. That's it. And away we go. I got the chicken cross the road. To get to the other side. Come along, my boy. Take off the blindfold now. Mm 
Mr. Biddle? What is this place? The foyer, of course. Those two chairs, they, they look like thrones. What else? But Mr. Biddle. <laughs> What can I do you for? Good evening. Is he in? Hmm, let me see. Maybe yes, maybe no. Tell him number 709 is here with the recruit. Alrighty then. Try not to miss me while I'm gone. In the meantime, gentlemen, be seated. Who is that? Huh, what does it look like? A clown, of course. Well, you heard him. Sit down. I recommend the chair on the left. If you say so. There. Feel better? I suppose. My turn now. <laughs> Mr. Biddle, are you all right? <sighs> Perfectly. Here. Take my hand. <laughs> I'm disappointed in you, Kincaid. You are? Didn't you find that the least bit funny? Just now, when I went sprawling? No, sir. You could have been hurt. Oh, James, please. Try. Try. Don't tell me you've forgotten how to laugh. Not you. I was so sure. Sir, if you'd only explain to me... No, there's too much explaining in the world and not enough laughing. We're all turning into a race of machines. Cold, efficient, heartless machines. Ta-da! Who are you? Feast your eyes. Ever seen the smug before, huh, huh? The executor. He does wonders with makeup, huh? For a court jester, that is. The face doesn't quite go with that three-pointed hat. What's the matter? You don't like it? I didn't say that. Then I guess the yoke's on me. Well, don't just stand there with egg on your face. What goes up the chimney down but not down the chimney up, huh? Quickly. I, I, I don't understand the question. Would you repeat it? Too late. Timing is everything. <sighs> go on, tell him. An umbrella. What? An umbrella. I don't know, Biddle. I'm very dubious. He chuckled. So you say. I haven't heard anything. What's that? Sounds like the phone to me. Well, don't just do something. Stand there. Jester here. It's for you. It is? Hello? I say, hello? <laughs> Sir! <laughs> it squirted me right in the eye. Must be an overseas call. Better clam up. Mm, I'm all wet. You sure are. Now I really need a towel. Oh, Biddle. Yes? I've got something for you. Watch out! Spoil sport. But he's got something behind his back. Where? Right! Here. But I don't like pie. Mmm, lemon meringue. You're positively reeking. Time to hose off, and nothing leaves you squeaky clean like good old seltzer. <laughs> Who's got the soap? Forget soap. You need your rubber ducky. Or a lifeboat. <laughs> now, wait a minute. It's not possible. What's wrong, Kincaid? You'd better get a change of clothes, Mr. Biddle, or you'll catch your death. You see? Hopeless. That's it. Wait, wait. He's only a beginner. But we must be so careful, Biddle. Yes, yes, but give him a chance. Very well. One last test. Glad to meet you, Mr. Kincaid. Put her there. I don't... Go on. Shake. Ow! Oh, that didn't hurt. It's just a joy buzzer. You wind it up, and when someone shakes your hand... That's it! That's it! I've had it! I don't know what any of this is about, but I know one thing. I don't want any part of it. You people, you people, you're out of your heads! You're all loony! You're psycho! 
I'm getting out of here right now, and don't try to stop me. Uh-oh. Another fine mess you've gotten us into. <laughs> Let me out of here! You see? A motion. I'll admit that's encouraging. James, this way out. If you please, it's just through here. No tricks this time? No tricks. Wait, this is a library. A small reading room for our members. Members? Mr. Biddle told you nothing? He asked me to meet him. I thought it was about work. What is this building? Used to be offices. Now it's abandoned, so we made it our headquarters. Headquarters of what? The SPOL. The Society for the Preservation of Laughter. Have a seat. Oh, no. Now this one's a real chair, I promise. Well, just for a minute. Oops. Hey! That was not me. <laughs> you sure, my boy? Sorry, I must have left an old whoopee cushion under the seat. Collector's item now, you know? Here, let me get it. Go on, make yourself comfortable while I explain. You see, James, we're a secret organization. A kind of underground, if you will. Running counter to established law in the Commonwealth. Most of what we do is either frowned upon as bad taste or legally forbidden. We are, in short, outlaws. I don't like the sound of that. An old tradition. Ever hear of something called speakeasies? They were secret clubs that sold liquor during Prohibition. Well, this is a laugh-easy. All these books, the posters on the walls, Laurel and Hardy, the Three Stooges. Who are they? All great clowns from the past. There's Perot, Punch and Judy, Bozo. We try to keep the tradition alive. What tradition? You see, Mr. Kincaid, the world has forgotten how to laugh. There are some of us who regret that fact. Unlike those in power, we feel that laughter is important enough to be preserved at any cost. Am I getting through to him? What the jester is trying to say, well, the world used to be a pretty terrible place, you see, James. We had disease and war and depression and prejudice and a lot of unpleasant things. The people couldn't change it all, but they could do their best to endure it. How did they endure it? By laughing at it, ridiculing it. They laughed at everything then. But along came the psychologists and the censors, and suddenly nobody could tell a sexual joke or a racial joke or a sick joke or any kind of joke. They weren't politically correct. And that was the end of humor. We're trying to keep it alive. Take the trick cigar. You chuckled. I did not. Yes, you did, and I'll tell you why. Because a figure of authority became ridiculous, understand? Oh, James, try. A laugh cannot be forced, Biddle. You should know that. I do, but... Let's get to the main test. It's just through here, the last door. Everything should be ready. No false laughs now. We can spot them a mile away, understand? Wait a minute. This looks like... Spears Research. Where you work, Kincaid. Where I work. A perfect replica, down to the smallest detail. But how? It's nothing, really. We have art directors, carpenters, just a matter of painting a set, some props. And now, the music. And the screen. The executor. The executor. Is he given an address? You'll see. Okay, everybody stand up. Citizens, I greet you. It pleases me to report that our gross national product... Oh, oh, yeah, the goal we have set. The Yay, is a tomato for you. Better the World Council shows a decrease... In our broadcast has been temporarily interrupted. Refreshing, wouldn't you say? But it's unpatriotic. 
<sighs> Perhaps you should talk to your fellow workers. Miller? Is that you? Who wants to know? It's me. Kincaid. But how... A rubber mask. Realistic, if I do say so. Watch this. He's about to reboot his computer. Now, boss? Now. <laughs> Well, Kincaid? Well, what? His computer, man. It blew up in his face. What do you say to that? Computers are awfully expensive. The World Stock Exchange Terminal. It's just come online. But Wall Street's closed for the night. They're open in Tokyo. Watch. Executor said the gross national product was in good shape. Oh, not much hope for him. One more angle. Try this. Lindsay? Hi, Jim. But this isn't your computer. I traded it for a video poker machine. Got a quarter? A quarter? Come on, I'm on a roll. One more win and I'll buy lunch. What do you say? All right. Jackpot! I hit it, Jim. Or rather, we did. How about lunch? In Paris. We can take the rocket shuttle and be back before Biddle knows we're gone, okay? I don't know. The French have been very un-American lately. James, get with the program, boy. I'm trying, sir. You certainly are. I need a drink. Come on, the bar's this way. I'm afraid I've done all I can. Okay, everybody. You can take your masks off now. Mark his scores, please. On a scale of one to ten, I give him a three. Shh, two and a half. That's too much. I say a big fat zero. <laughs> I agree with yeah, you. That's, zero. that's it for me. Yeah. What'll it be, germs? Uh, I mean, gents. <clears throat> Martini. Double. And one for my friend here. Make it special. Coming right at you. Were those my judges? Don't worry about it. I haven't given up on you yet. How about a game of darts? But, sir, the target's there. Pictures of the executor. So they are. How about a rotten egg? Eggs? Uh, right there in the basket, gentlemen. Uh, well, you can throw. I don't know, sir. Oh, come on. This is the man who destroyed fun. Who took away the good times. But you've hated me, haven't you, James? As a boss. No, no, you have. I know. And with good reason. I've been a stern, pompous ass. But I'm competent at my job. The company can trust me. I know my role, but <laughs> I'm not at work now. Oh, oh good one. Yeah. Yeah, good one. Right in the old schnozzola. <laughs> Try one? Well, okay. Good boy. Got him right in the eye. <laughs> Another? If you say so. Ha <laughs> ha. He took it on the chin. Now try the neck. That's always funny. Two martinis. Wait. Drinks first. <laughs> this one's yours. Well, through the teeth and over the gums. Look out, stomach. Here it comes. My glass is leaking. Of course it is. That's what's called a dribble glass. See the little slits in the side? When you tip it to drink, voila! Doesn't that tickle your funny bone? Uh-huh. <laughs> 
Uh, it's a start. Two more. No problem. Here's your drinks. Thank you, my good man. Cheers. I think I'm starting to like these. Keep them coming. My pleasure, sir. Look at the screen. Know who that is? Who? Betty Boop. A flapper, they called her. <laughs> Always doing the Charleston. Here, turn it up. Want to dance, Mr. Biddle? Do I? Hold my drink, James. <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet. I'm laughing. Mr. Kincaid. Uh, did I pass? Huh? What did the judges say? If I could have a word with you outside. Tell me, I'm laughing. I must be. See? I I've never felt this way before. Sorry, Mr. Kincaid. Time's up. Morning, Jim. Morning, Lindsay. You're looking sexy as usual. What? Later, alligator. We're on for Paris, by the way. I don't know what you're... The rocket shuttle? Oh, that's right. It wasn't really you. Well, I'll explain. As soon as I talk to old man Biddle... Jim, have you been drinking? After a while, crocodile. Come in. Hi. You are 17 minutes late. I know. Those martinis, uh, whatever they were, they really got to me. Martinis? I hadn't even tasted this stuff before last night. <laughs> Sorry. I was pretty plastered. Who took me home? I don't know what you're talking about. About last night. S-P-O-L. Hey, why does the fireman wear red suspenders? What? To keep his pants up! <laughs> Are you sick, Kincaid? Oh, come on, Mr. Biddle. I know I was a disappointment to you, but it was also new. They're not going to hold it against me because I didn't laugh, are they? I didn't know how. But I do now. Listen. <laughs> Kincaid? <laughs> yes, sir? You're fired. So the judges ruled against me. I don't blame him. You can fix it, can't you? Get out. All I want is a second chance. Is that too much to ask? I can learn. If I don't, what will happen? Yuma will die, and comedy, and all the great... I don't know what you're babbling about, Kincaid, but I warn you, if you repeat any of it to the authorities, they'll put you away. Do you understand? One thing I cannot afford to do in my line of work is take chances, and you... You're... you're not a good enough risk. Do I make myself clear? But, sir... Do I make myself clear? Ah, uh, evening to you. Evening? I was wondering, can you spare a smoke? Sorry, I don't... Wait a minute. Have you ever seen me before? You? Well, no, I... Uh... Did you smoke a cigar last night? Oh, oh yeah. I think I did. Here. Get yourself a cup of Kappa Java. Hey, thanks. Can I ask you a question? Yeah? Would you happen to know where it is? Where what is? The place where they laugh. 
That's a good one. No laughing around here. It ain't allowed, you know. I know. Well, evening to you. Yeah. Seeing the funny papers. A section of the city known as No Man's Land. Mr. James Kincaid, once 39, but a lot older now. He frequents this neighborhood every night, perhaps hoping to hear the lovely, desperate sound of laughter echoing from a dark, unmarked building somewhere in the faraway reaches of the Twilight Zone. The Twilight Zone continues in just a moment. You are about to enter another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind, a journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop twilightzoneradio.com. Visit twilightzoneradio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD, or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. He's Alive, starring Peter Mark Richmond and Marshall Allman, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Roger Mueller, Jason Bradley, Christian Stolte, Doug James, Jeff Lupiton, Amanda Amari, Elizabeth Lido, Vince Amari, Alex Sopner, Frenette Lebo, Carl Amari, Kurt Nabig, Peggy Roeder, and Jason Mallow. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. That looks like a good spot. Where? Up ahead on the corner. Yeah, we'll set up some boxes. I don't know. It's perfect, I tell you. All these people taking a walk after dinner, they'll listen. Oh, they'll listen, all right. Just hand out the pamphlets for now. I have to work on my speech. What speech? You don't need one. Just say it the way you say it to us. These people, they don't know what we stand for. So tell them, Pete. We'll make sure they listen. Put the flag up against the building. Which one? Both of them. Ours and Old Glory. The big two. There's some boxes. You can stand on them. I'll go set them up. Man, oh man, this is gonna be the night, huh, Pete? Well, I guess it's now or never. You got that right. How's my uniform look? Here, straighten your tie. The cap, the boots, perfect. You look like a leader. Big time. Go, Pete. Give him a dose of the truth. Hey, mister. Excuse me, little girl. Are you in the army? No army you ever heard of, sweetheart, but you will. My daddy's a lieutenant. Are you a lieutenant? Better than that, kid. A lot better. Now stand back. You're in the way. <clears throat> Good evening. G Good evening, neighbors. I... I have something of great importance to tell you. If, if, um, 
if if you you all get gather around. Neighbors? Who's neighbors? Yeah, we're not your neighbors. I never saw him around here. Yeah, me neither. Look at those crazy outfits they're wearing. Yeah, they look like real idiots. Uh, I I bring you a message that you'll all want to hear. What are you selling? Vegetable choppers? Cause I already bought one. I, it's. <coughs> it, well, hear hear me out, folks. Hey, what's with the goopy flag? Yeah, it's got lightning bolts on it. Well, maybe they're looking for a few good men for Halloween. I, I want to talk to you about international communism and, and the secret masters of the World Bank. I'm not joking, neighbors. Do you know who's really behind it? Look, look, look at our economy. It's falling apart. It's, it's because of the bankers. That's, that's right. The economics of the world, now, then, and forever, have always been the breeding ground for a certain type. An insidious type. The worshippers of the golden calf, whose religion is gold, whose loyalty first and foremost is to money, and only money. And, and we know who, we know who loves money more than anyone else, don't we? We know what tribe. He's just getting warmed up. Yep, in a minute he'll have him in the palm of his hand. The tribe of traitors. And they're here, in our homeland. They're in Washington. Those swine have captured the reins of government. Yeah, they're rotten apples, and I got an apple for you. Hey, knock it off, people. Yeah, show some respect. I'm talking about traitors. Listen. Boring, boring. Ice cream. Get your ice cream. I want one. Come on, Angie. We'll both get one. Then we'll go home. Yeah, there's nothing happening here. No, 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 no. Listen to this. What about, what about foreigners? Huh? Foreigners! Take a look at the way that they're controlling us. The lines lead directly to Palestine. And, and, to, to the Vatican. Yeah, I've had about enough of this. Let's go. It's a conspiracy, I tell you. A conspiracy of men who aren't like us. Yellow men, brown men, black men. They come here and they infiltrate our economy. They're right here on our doorstep. If there's anybody sitting on your doorstep, buddy, it's the man in the white coat. Here, take a tomato with you. You think that's pretty funny, don't you? You think it's funny that your country can be sold out? That they can sell out your flag and your birthright? You think that's funny, huh? Well, the day will come. Oh, shut up. Let him talk. What's the matter? No more big talk? He's just a scrawny kid with a big mouth. Real big. As long as he got a couple of punks to protect you. We gotta do something. Where's Nick? Go on, get out of here. Back off, this here's a real American. Yeah, a real jerk. Why, you? Get it off! Cut it off! Cut it off! Portrait of a Bush League Fuhrer named Peter Volver. A young man who feeds off his self-delusions and is left perpetually hungry. Like his goose-stepping predecessors, he searches for something to explain this hunger, to rationalize why the world passes him by without saluting. In his own twisted and distorted lexicon, he calls it faith, strength, truth. But the particular brand of truth he seeks can be found in any sewer. Peter Vollmer doesn't know it yet, but he is about to ply his trade on another corner, an intersection in a strange shadowland called the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, He's Alive, starring Marshall Allman and Peter Mark Richman, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. All right, folks, break it up. Party's over. Yeah, what's happening here? Looks like the boys in the brown shirts took a licking. No, we got them. We got them good. Then what are you lying on the ground for? Problem, fellas? It was the communists. The communists did this. What? Which one's are those, Jack? 
All of them. They ran away like cowards. We want to press charges. What about names? We need names if we're gonna charge anybody. Look, forget about it. We can take care of ourselves. Sure you can. You need some medical attention? No. We don't need your help. Come on, Peter. I'll help you up. Let's get out of here. Hey, Jack. You forgot your flag. Yeah, your mama made it for you. Give it to me. Sure, sure. There'll come a day when guys like you will crawl on your belly to salute this. There'll come a day. Yeah, well, let me know the date, Jack, so I can stay home sick. Hey, Pete! Pete! Are you okay? Yeah, we're fine. What are you doing in the alley? They cornered me. Must have been eight, uh, ten guys on top of me. It was all I could do to get away. You sure that's what happened? Sure, I'm sure. Oh, mean crowd, Pete. You, you get a hot night, and you always get a mean crowd. Remember when I was telling you that? Uh, remember when I was telling you that every time you get a hot night? All right, all right. Okay, Pete. Okay. Why? I tried. And I tried hard up there tonight, but I couldn't get through. I couldn't get them to listen. Words never come out right. You did good. Real good. Someday they'll listen. They'll have to. They'll listen and they'll cheer. Someday they will, Pete. You'll see. Someday. Now, hold still. Ah. <laughs> it's only a, only a cut, not a mortal wound. Wash your face when you get home and put some iodine on it. I think you will survive. Now, do you want a cup of coffee? I'd rather have a drink. A drink, is it? May I have a drink, Ernst? I have some wine. Will that do? Yes, please. Very well. You are a man now. Thank you. Uh, Peter, one sips wine. That's not beer from a beer garden. <laughs> Sorry. I'll remember that next time. The next time. Just how many next times do you suppose a human being has in the scheme of things? Oh, come on, don't lecture me, Ernst. I'm sick, I'm tired, and I took a beating out there. Did you? Yeah, can I stay the night? Yeah, the couch remains in the corner, as usual. You're a good friend, Ernst. You understand. Sad to say, I do. A man does what he believes in. A man usually does. I believe in certain things. Is that right? You know I do. I mean, we're friends. You know me since I was a kid. When you were a little kid, Peter, and I used to find you crying at my door late at night, I could pity you then. And now? What do you think? Now you peddle hate on street corners as if it were popcorn. It's not hate. It's a point of view. A philosophy. Oh, I know the philosophy. I know it quite well. Nine years in a place called Dachau. And you know who put me there? Peter Vollmer. What? A lot of Peter Vollmers. Frustrated men, sick men, hungry men. But the result, the effect, never mind the cause, was 12 million bodies in shallow graves. And it all started with young men in uniforms, talking on street corners. Hey, you let me come here. You never sent me away. No, I never did. I never do. That's uh, the weakness that you scream about on your street corner. The sentimentality, the softness, the weakness that makes a man his brother's keeper. 
So I must be one of the worst of your criminals, Peter. Sentimental, soft, and very preoccupied with my brothers. I should close the door on you, but perhaps this is my sickness. I... I only see the boy, not the man. Go ahead. Sleep on my couch. Look, why don't you understand? You're the only person in the world I ever had. What else have I had? What? A drunk father who used to throw me against the wall? An old lady who drank till she had no marbles in her head? She didn't even recognize me half the time. That's, wh that's why I used to come over here to your apartment because, I mean, you were gentle with me, you know? You'd talk to me. You'd feed me. You'd take care of me. Ernst, you're, you're my real father. Ah, this is the boy speaking again. The little boy with so much fear in him. Yeah, you rest now, Peter. You rest well. No. 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 What? What? Peter! Who's that? Peter. Who's out there? Who is it? A friend, Mr. Bull. A friend? You have need of friends. Yeah. Allies. Yeah, come downstairs, Mr. Former. Come down and we'll talk, you and I. Hello, Mr. Former. I heard people out here. Oh, did you? And your voice. Well, a dream, perhaps, of better days to come. Who are you? Take a good look. Do you not recognize me? Surely you have seen my picture. Wait. That hair. With the mustache. No. <laughs> I can't be. You, you died a long time ago. Did I? Or perhaps I only wanted people to think so. <laughs> but you, you were... A, you're a great man. I am aware of your opinion. How did you know where to find me? I simply followed your tears, Mr. Foreman. You said you have something to talk about? I, I do. I do indeed. I have you to talk about. On the things you believe in, which are the things I believe in as well. See, your success, Mr. Volmer, will be my success. Are you interested? I am. I, I am. Uh, please go on. Ah, good. Then let us start by discussing a most important point. What are the dynamics of a crowd? Hmm? How do you move them, Mr. Volmer? How do you excite them? How do you make them feel as one with you? I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know, sir. How? <laughs> Join them first, Mr. Volmer. Yeah? When you address them, speak as if you were a part of the mob. Speak to them in their language, on their level. Make them hate the things you hate. How do I do that? If they are poor, talk to them about poverty. If they are afraid, talk to them about their fears. And if they are angry, Mr. Former, ah, if they are angry, give them objects for their anger. But most of all, what is most of the essence is that you make the mob an extension of yourself. Say to them things like, uh, yeah, uh, things like this. They call us hate mongers. They say we're prejudiced. They say we're biased. They say we hate the minorities. The minorities. Understand the term, neighbors. Minorities? Should I tell you? 
who the minorities are, shall I? We are. We are the minorities. That way, Mr. Warner. See, you, you started that way. Uh, I, uh... I think I understand. That's right. Um... <clears throat> Neighbors. Neighbors, they call us hate mongers. That's it, that's it, more. They say we're prejudiced. They say we're biased. Yeah, 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 now you have got it, go on. The minorities understand the turn, neighbors. The minorities. Shall I tell you who the minorities are? We, we, we are the minorities. <laughs> because patriotism is the minority. Because love of country is the minority. Because to live in a free white America seems to be a minority opinion. Let me tell you something, neighbors. I want you to dwell on this. Just, just dwell on it. Once we had an atom, and suddenly the Russians had it. We wanted to send men into space, but it was the Russians who got there first. We had a hydrogen bomb. It was the Russians who exploded theirs. Who gave them the bombs? Who sold us out? Who stabbed us in the back? Well, if it's the minority opinion that we must survive, then we are the minority. And this minority will not stop until it's the majority. This minority will not give up the fight. No, this is the promise and this is the legacy! Look, I'm not gonna wait much longer, you understand? Gibbons, cool it. Pretty good crowd tonight, huh? Great crowd, and you were great, Pete. I mean it. <laughs> Thanks, Stanley. They're finally responding. Responding? You had them right where you want them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this here is my hall. You've been renting it all this time, but I ain't got the money yet. Hey, can't you see we're busy? <laughs> okay, boys. I'll put it to you this way. If I don't get paid right now, you don't have the hall tomorrow night. You got that? I'll go count the donations. What's the problem? Oh, this is a hungry man here, Pete. He's got to have his shekels. You know the type. I told you guys you're three weeks behind on the rent. You said you'd give it to me a week ago, and all I got was a cigarette butt on the floor. But after tonight, that's it. Excuse me. Am I to understand that you're going to lock us out of this meeting hall because of a couple weeks' lousy rent? Oh, you understand right. Six hundred bucks due. Six hundred bucks that ain't been received. We happen to be a young movement. We're still struggling. We need time to grow. I don't rent time. I just rent the hall. It's the money. Or you put up a soapbox in the street. A soapbox in the street? What do we do, Pete? We gotta do something. I don't see why we have to tiptoe around this guy. Why don't I just educate him? Look, Frank, I don't know. I don't know. Why don't you just hold on a second? I can do it, guaranteed. Well, I know you can, Frank. Somebody left this for you, Pete. Who? Nobody saw him. Just left this envelope at the back door. Your name's on it. <laughs> there's... There's money inside. Six C-notes. Hey, how about that? We need 600 bucks, and here it is. Oh, man, how about that? Hey, Gibbons, come and get it. About time. You satisfied? Then don't bother us. All right, all right. You're paid up through this week. Where'd the dough come from, Pete? You have any idea? We must have a secret supporter. I can see why. You were really something tonight. I can't even tell you how it sounded. You had him. You really had him. Hey, we're gonna make it. And now something tells me we're really gonna make it. You bet your life. You guys go on. I'll see you outside. Sure, Pete. Anything you say. Uh, 
excellent performance, Mr. Fulmer. Yes, yeah, very effective. Very effective. You learn quickly. <laughs> well, thank you. I didn't know you were here. I am always here. Please, to be of help. Uh, you learned the style very well. You delivered it precisely as I told you. Well, I'm very obliged. And the money? Oh, it was the least I could do. We couldn't have you thrown out into the streets. Yeah. <laughs> I happen to feel that your work is very important. You're with us? With you. Oh, Mr. Vollmer, you might say I am you. Now, I have some suggestions. I'll continue to give you speeches, but there's a matter of importance that must be taken care of. What is it? An expedient, Mr. Vollmer. Oh, you might call it a cause celebre. Huh? Something to cement the organization together. I, I don't understand. The organization needs a martyr. A martyr? Mm -hmm. How do we find a martyr? Uh, <laughs> you don't find one, Mr. Fulmer. <laughs> you choose one. You pick out the one of least value, and you make him a symbol. You wrap him in a flag, and you make his death work for you. Find a man, Mr. Fulmer, who has no worth while he's alive, but who can serve you when he's dead. Like who? Oh, come on. Surely there is such a one. Pete, uh, they're waiting. Uh, be right, be right there, Nick. Okay. Thought I heard voices. You, you talking to somebody? No, no. Just, I'm just practicing my next speech. Look. Hey, tell Frank to come in here, would you? Right away. Alone. Sure thing, Pete. Hmm, an excellent choice, Mr. Vollmer. The little fat one. <laughs> yeah. Now, all you have to do is arrange it. The only thing is... I I've known Nick for a long time. I isn't there some other way? Other way? No, there is no other way, Mr. Vollmer. And if you weaken now, there's no point in going on. When Frank comes back, tell him you've discovered an informer. Tell him the informer has done you irreparable damage. The informer must be put out of the way, but cleverly, subtly, so that there is some question as to who is responsible. But Nick's been with us from the beginning. The beginning? <laughs> no, Mr. Fulmer. None of you were at the beginning. None of you. Nick's my friend. And this is an act of friendship. We are allowing him to serve the cause. How glorious for him. Nick says you wanted to see me? We, um... We got a stoolie in the group, Frank. A stoolie? Yeah. Nick. Nick's been talking. And I think he's working for the police. No. I know it to be a fact. Everything we've done, everything we've said, Nick snitched on us. Are you sure? Beyond a shadow of a doubt. Well, what do you want to do, Pete? Get rid of him. Get rid of him so... so that it looks like, um, somebody else did it. Make it, make it look like, uh, someone who hates us. I understand. I understand, Pete. You call it, you got it. There you are, officers. Thank God. Stay calm, ma'am. Now just tell us, where's this body? Over here, in the alley. Shine your flashlight on it. Look at all that blood. Somebody did quite a number on him, huh? I've seen him before. It's one of those young hooligans. You can tell by the uniform. He's dead, all right. Call a meat wagon. What was this one's name? Wait a minute. There's a note pinned to his chest. What does it say? A good fascist. What do you suppose that means? One of their enemies must have put it there. After he beat him to death. 
Yeah, but which enemy? <laughs> There's a lot of them around here. Fewer and fewer every day. Hurry up, Frank. We've been waiting for you. Is it done? Cross off the little creep. Anything else? Then, we finally have our martyr. Pete, you better go on. They're going nuts in there. It's a good crowd tonight? Right to the ceiling. What's the matter, Stanley? Oh, uh, nothing. Then why the look? It's just that... Nick was a nice guy, Pete. I miss him. Stanley, you listen to me. You forget about Nick right now. He was a fat pig with no guts. He was a greasy big mouth who copped out every time he took a breath. A nickel and dime Judas who got exactly what he deserved. So don't mourn for Nick. He doesn't rate mourning. Not that pig. You got that, Stanley? Look at me, Stanley. You got that? Yeah. You have his poster ready? Blown up bigger than life. Just like you said. Good. When I give the signal, unveil it behind the podium. All right, everyone. I have something very important to say. A man of honor has died tonight. A decent, courageous fighter for the cause of freedom. He gave his life. He gave his life for us. Some skulking assassin murdered him. But friends and neighbors and co-fighters, Nick Bloss did not die in vain. They stilled his great heart, but they could not stifle his memory. They could not obliterate his courage. They could not wipe away his honor. He lives, my friends. He lives in you, and he lives in me. He lives deep in the gut of any human being who believes that the United States of America should be free, should be untainted, should be free from the mongrels who try to enslave it. Now, Stanley, look at this portrait of Nick Bloss in his uniform. He wore it proudly. He died for it. And you and I, neighbors, we will live for it. Oh, hiya, Mr. Gans. Uh, how do you do? How are you tonight? Uh, I'm very sober, unfortunately. Beer? Yeah, if you please. Boy, listen to him across the street. Guy's got a voice on him. And I knew it when it was only a whimper. That's a wild kid, that one. Used to be people would laugh at him, but lately he gets the crowd. Uh, not many people laugh now. Say, you know him, don't you? Yeah, since he was a child. A silent little boy with very little to say. But now, I've been here before. Oh, yes. I've seen and heard it all before. That was another time, Mr. Gans. Another place. Another kind of people. That stuff doesn't go here. That's what we said, too. They were brown shirt scum. Temporary insanity. Part of the passing scene. Too monstrous to be real. So we ignored them. Or laughed at them. Because we couldn't believe that there were enough insane people to march for their cause. And then, one morning, the country woke up from an uneasy sleep and there was no more laughter. The Peter Volmers had taken over. The wild animals had changed places with the zookeepers. Another one, Mr. Gans? Ah, no, thank you. I've had... I have had my fill. You take it easy now. You're not going to do anything foolish, are you? Me? 
Not this time. It mustn't happen again. We can't let it. We simply can't let it happen again. All the anguish, all the horror, all the nightmare. No, 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 no. Not this time. Mr. Gans? Mr. Gans! And so I tell you, my friends, we will take it to the streets. There's going to be a big meeting tomorrow night with searchlights and banners and drums and armbands. For every one of you who wants to join us, we have armbands. And soon, very soon, we will have uniforms for all of you. When we march, when we march! Who's that? Search me. Go on, Mr. Volma. You are saying? Ernst, what are you doing here? I can tell them what you were saying. I have heard it all before. I have heard it a thousand times before. In Munich, in Berlin, on a hundred different street corners. It was drivel then, and it is drivel now. Ernst, you've got to stop. And uh, what is this one here? The latest model? A new Führer right off the assembly line? Well, this one isn't so new. He is just a cheap copy. Oh, let me tell you about this one. About the breed, the species. They are all alike. <laughs> Problem children with delusions. Sick, sad neurotics who need applause like a needle. <laughs> That's enough, Ernst. Please. Please. Listen to me, Peter. And let them listen. Or I will tell them about a quaking, whimpering boy who cried on my couch, who still cries on my couch. Ernst, don't. They need parades and torchlights and slogans like therapy. They need uniforms and armbands, because without them, they are naked and pitiful. This one grew too old to bite his nails, so he made believe he could lead others. Pete, don't let him have the mic. Put him down, or I'll put him down. Yeah, yeah, put me down, Peter. Shut me up. Stifle me, huh? Why don't you? Why can't you? Because... Because this is your courage right here. The symbol on your sleeve. A torch on a lightning bolt. A crude drawing for children. I'm warning you, Ernst. This patch is your strength. This and the crowds and the sick aisles. And if I tell you to your face, Peter, that your courage is made out of cloth, that your ideas are filthy garbage, and that you are something less than a man. What do you say to that? How do you answer me? Like this! Oh, the rebuttal. The only answer your kind knows how to give. Is that the best you can do? A bloody nose? This is your Führer? He is yours. I give him to you. A gift from the sewers. You see, folks, the way, the way it is. Hey, Pete, don't worry about it. He's just an old man. One crummy old man. The way it is, I knew him. I knew the old man once. Is that a fact, Mr. Former? Yes, that is a fact. I used to know him, and... Who's he talking to? Mr. Former, I have no interest in who he is. My concern is in what he is. He cheapened you in front of these people. You barely had the strength to strike him uh, a slap, like a woman. Your voice is like a lion, but your instincts are a rabbit's. And you? Instincts like a rabbit? Slap like a woman? You, you stand in the darkness and plan the battles, but you're never there when they're fought. 
No, no. Why don't you come up here alongside me, huh? Why don't you let them see who you really are? Why don't you make a speech? Mr. Fulmer, I was making speeches before you knew how to read them. I was fighting battles when you were struggling to get out of a womb. I was taking over the world when your universe was a crib. And as for my standing in the darkness, Mr. Fulmer, I invented darkness. Then you take the stage. Go on. It's all yours. Hey. Pete, who were you talking to? Where are you going? You can't run out. Ernst! Ernst! Where are you? Let me explain! You! Why? Why did you pick me? I didn't pick you, Mr. Former. You picked me. You chose my ideas. You invoked my name. So now, you must take whatever comes with it. What? In the past, I've given you suggestions. Now, I give orders. Orders? What do you want me to do? From now on, you must be built of steel. No soft gaps of sentiment. Steel, Mr. Volmer. The way we handled Nick and the mobs and the speeches. And gradually, bit by bit, we shall forge something strong. Something powerful. Just as I did before. With my own hands. With my own hands. The old man, the Jew, he'll be back again tomorrow night. The next night, I know him. I know the type. We sent them into the ovens. But always, always, there was a handful left to point a finger. His kind, Mr. Fulmer. His kind are dangerous. See, they talk, they think, they plant seeds, they hold us back. Here. Take, take, take this. What is it? What do you think? A Luger 9mm pistol. My personal sidearm. Kill him. Kill the old man. Kill Ernst? Tonight, he will be in his room. If you are man enough. If you are steel. All right. I'll do it. I'll do it now. Oh, then, Mr. Former, when you come back, there's much we have to talk about. Plans. Yeah. Campaigns. Ideas. The next steps. This is only the beginning. The dawn. It will be a long, long day. Yeah? Oh, come in. Ah, I thought it was you. You wouldn't listen to me, Ernst. On the contrary, I listened to all that I was able to stand. You should pay attention now. I can't even begin to tell you what's happened. It's too incredible. It's too unbelievable. I can tell you this much. We're on the march. From now on, we only go forward. There's no stopping us. No stopping you, Peter? An old man stopped you tonight with a few words. He stopped you with the truth. You're wrong, Ernst. It's not just me anymore. There's someone else. Someone behind us. Someone even you tremble at. Mm, he'd have to be a very imposing figure, Peter. Much more imposing than you. <sighs> oh. Oh, he is. He gave me this. See? More imposing even than a gun. 
That's only because you don't think I'll use it. Which only goes to show that you don't know me. I know you, Peter. I know you. From a ravaged little boy wanting love, to a torn man looking for respect, identity. I don't feel you. So you may do what you have in mind at any time you wish. With this one last reminder, you can never kill an idea with a bullet. Never. No, no. I'm all steel now. Ernst, I'm made out of steel. No more sentiment, no more softness. Just purpose, just will. Then shoot, kill, destroy me if you can. Am I close enough to you, hmm? You're frightened. Admit it. Not at all. Impatient and a little bored. With living? With having to live in a time that produces people like you. Once, years ago, you made death inviting. You still do. So do me the goodness, Peter. Get it over with as quickly as possible. I'm waiting, Peter. Kill him, Volma! Kill the old man! Kill the Jew! Use strength! Use will! Be made of steel, Volmer. Kill him! Kill him now! You see, Ernst? I told you! I told you! I'm made of steel! All steel. All strength. But at the expense of things that most other men have. Some fragments of decency that tell them right from wrong. That makes them that make them love. Yes, Peter, you have steel, but now you have no heart. Where is everybody? Pete? We were just cleaning up. What happened to you? No, nothing Nothing happened to me. You tell them. You go out there and you tell them. But they've all gone home. Tell them I'm still in charge. I'm number one. You serve, I lead. Understand? You serve, I lead. Come on, Pete. Let's go. No, he picked me. Out of everybody, he picked me. What's wrong? Don't you believe me? He did. He picked me. So long, Pete. See ya. Don't you walk away from me! Frank! Frank! Who's there? Who is that? Volmer? You. I... I did what you said. Sentimentality, Mr. Volmer? None! Steel. Steel. And no regrets. None. What did you destroy tonight? Only a disease. A growth on our flesh that had to be removed. Not a man, then. No. Hardly a man. How did it feel? It felt... It felt like... I was immortal. <laughs> Mr. Volmer, we are... Immortal. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 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 There he is. Don't move. What do you want? Peter Vollmer? Yes. We have a warrant for your arrest. That's impossible. The charge is conspiracy to commit murder. Your two friends are outside in cuffs. The victim's name was Nicholas Bloss. Uh, get away from me. He's got a gun. Drop the gun! Now! Walk toward us with your hands up! Hey, look, he's going to the other door. Tell him to cover the alley. Halt! Halt! Or I'll shoot!
Hold it right there. We got him. He's hit. Call for an ambulance. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you. There's something very wrong. <coughs> There's something very wrong. Easy, kid. Don't try to talk. But you, you made made a terrible mistake. I'm, I'm, I'm made a steal. I, it's true. Don't you understand? I'm, I'm, I'm made, made, made a steal. I'm made a steal. I made a steal. I made a steal. Where will he appear next? This phantom from another time, this resurrected ghost of an old nightmare. Chicago, Los Angeles, Miami, Florida, perhaps. Vincennes, Indiana, Syracuse, New York. Any place, every place where there's hate, where there's prejudice, where there's bigotry. Because he's alive. He's alive so long as these evils exist. Remember that when he comes to your town. Remember it when you hear his voice speaking through the mouths of others, no matter who they may be. Remember it when you hear a name called a minority slandered. Any blind, unreasoning attack on a people or any human being. He's alive. Because through these things, we keep him alive. The Twilight Zone continues in just a moment. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop, twilightzoneradio.com. Visit twilightzoneradio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD, or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Oh, hi there, Pete. Didn't hear you come in. Why don't you join us? Set a spell. Oh, that's all right. I wouldn't want to interrupt you. Well, all right then. Where was I? General Pershing. Oh, yeah. So I said to Jack Pershing, General, I said there ain't going to be no artillery support. They're dug in too deep. When was this now? First World War, of course. The Great War, we called it. Yes, sir. So I says to General Pershing, Jack, what we got to do is we got to uh, enfilade. Know what I mean? Do what? Enfilade him. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> Enfilade him to beat the band. Frisbee, when are you going to put that mouth organ of yours out of its misery? How's that? Or at least learn how to play it. Helps me relax. Well, sir, old Blackjack knew who he was dealing with. And that was? They didn't call me old Enfilade Frisbee for nothing. <laughs> Horseradish? Huh? Where do you keep the horseradish, Frisbee? Right where it always was, Pete. Third shelf down. Down where? On your left there, next to the pickles. You got catsup? Underneath the cash register, behind the beans. What's your hurry? Come on over. I got another chair. Uh, no thanks. I'll put a new log in the stove. If it's all the same to you, Frisbee, I'll just collect my goods and get on home while it's still daylight. Suit yourself. 
Oh, where, where was I? Oh, yeah. Well, sir, the following morning, we attacked up and down the line, and the rest is history. Smashed them to bits, we did. And then we went on to Paris to celebrate. Exactly four and a half hours it took us. We had frogs' legs and cold duck till we couldn't eat no more. <laughs> an hour later, we was in Berlin. Shall I say it, or do you want to? Be my guest. Frisbee. Yeah? You not only got a pot belly big as that stove, you're the biggest liar who ever sat in that chair. You're doubting my word? You can start with that. Beyond just doubting your word, I'm calling you a liar flat out. How can you go from Paris to Berlin in one hour? Find the radishes, Pete? Yep. Uh, what about celery? All out. Getting some fresh ones in the morning. We're waiting, Frisbee. How do you go from Paris to Berlin in one hour? Now hold your horses now. I'm coming to that. It's what made the whole operation so fantastic. I was doing some reconnoitering, and I found me a back route. That's very interesting, Frisbee. Except last week, you sat right there, big as life, and told us you were in the Balloon Corps. You sure did. And that over the Battle of Marne, you shot down three German Fokkers with a pistol and personally directed the artillery so the Marines could win. Oh, I did that, too. Only it was a year later. It was, uh, let's see now, um, April of 1917. That's it. I heard enough. More than enough. I'm getting out of here. Well, now you might want to give that some thought, boys. Looks like rain to me. Rain? Sure enough, gonna be some rain. Tell by the clouds. You can always tell by the clouds, you know. Take that big job up on the hill. That there is a strato cumulus uh, uh, opacus. Anything you say, Frisbee. You fellas know anything about meteorology? Don't get him started. Well, what do you know? Looks like it got me a customer. Hollowed full of them. Better get out there and pump some gas before they change their minds. Oh, now ain't no reason to hurry. Them clouds, for instance, they like to take their time. So do I. It's the way Mother Nature made things. Why, did I ever tell you about it? The slow-moving gentleman with the sizable mouth is Mr. Frisbee, proprietor of Frisbee's General Store the local version of Gimbel's and Macy's. He has all of the drive of a broken camshaft and the aggressive vinegar of a corpse. As you've no doubt gathered by now, his stock in trade is the tall tale, the outrageous falsehood, the bending of truth up to and beyond the breaking point. What he doesn't know is that the visitors in the car out front are a very special breed destined to change his life beyond anything even his fertile imagination could manufacture and embroider. The place is Pitchfield Flats. The time is the present, or thereabouts. And Mr. Frisbee is on the first leg of a rather fanciful journey into a place we call the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Hocus Pocus and Frisbee, starring Shelley Berman with Stacy Keach as your narrator. I believe I asked you boys a question. Oh, I'm sure you did. About meteorology. Well, I know plenty about that particular subject. University of Wichita it was. Got my doctorate in it. Did a treatise at the age of 13 that still used the standard text. Meteorology and You was the title. Talk was, it was the most scholarly treatise on the subject in the history of the field. My colleagues used to refer to me as Cumulus Frisbee. Cumulus Frisbee? Frisbee's a meteorologist. I'm vice president of the United States. Well, what do you say, Mr. VP? <coughs> Better get out there, Cumulus. I'm coming, I'm coming. All finished, Frisbee. You want to add it up? You do it, Pete. There's a pencil and paper right on the counter there. I could do it in my head for you, but it's been kind of a long day. I'm a little pooped out. Uh, one bottle of catsup. Horseradish. Ever tell you about the time I gave a demonstration, me against the computer machines? Thirteen of them lined up in an auditorium. A hundred and thirty-three columns of figures, eight digits apiece, and no pencil and paper, mind you, all in the head. Well, sir, people came from miles around. What happened, Frisbee? I thought no one would ever ask. Four of the machines broke down from overwork. 
Not you, of course. Two come up with incorrect answers, and I beat them all by 21 seconds. Ha <laughs> ha. That does it for me. I simply can't take no more, Frisbee, I gotta tell you. Can't take what? I wouldn't mind if you was a bright liar. I mean, if there was some logic to it, but Dad, gone the way you tell it, well, you'd have to be a hundred different people living in two hundred different places in twelve different periods of American history. Hallelujah and amen. Shucks. What are they in such an old fired hurry for? Time to do some work, Frisbee. You got customers. Yeah, you just said a dirty word. Only thing that works in Frisbee's whole body is his mouth. All right, all right. Keep your breeches on. Howdy, gents. Hello. Want gas or something? Gas? Oh, oh, yes. Sorry I had to wait. Not at all. You know, if you gotta be someplace in a hurry, you could have pumped it yourself. We could. Didn't you hear me yelling? Oh, we heard you. Definitely. We're not too familiar with this kind of car. No. Say how many of you was in there? Four of us. It's a bit of a tight fit, I'm afraid. Sure it is. One of them foreign jobs. Not much room inside, huh? We don't know where to put the gas. We... we aren't familiar at all with these... foreign jobs. You ain't? Well, this is your lucky day. Cause I am. <laughs> a matter of fact, I'm the one responsible for him. For a while, there, there was all rear engine. You know, only in the back. You developed them, did you? Oh, indeed I did. Got a phone call from old Henry Ford one time asking me to fly out to Detroit. Henry Ford? Sure. Well, I did that little thing, and next thing you know, in 48 hours, I went and designed the first rear-engine automobile. Advantages are fantastic, you know. Is that right? Sure. All the weight on the driving wheels gives her better traction, eliminating the drive shaft, lowering the whole car. There's a whole lot better visibility, plus the heat and gas fumes go right on out behind. You're quite familiar with the internal combustion engines, then. That sort of thing. Familiar with them? Why, <laughs> mister, you're looking at the granddaddy of the modern-day automobile. Henry said to me when I finished that there designing job, rear engine, he said, that's what he called me, old rear engine frisbee. He says, rear engine, you're an automotive genius. That's what you are. Hey, <laughs> well, you know, I couldn't very well argue with him being as how he was Henry Ford. I guess not. Now, where was I? Say, you want it filled up? If you don't mind. Not at all, not at all. That's what made this country work, work, and more work. Me, I've done more of it in my life, more different kinds of work than most people ever even heard of. Of course, I had more in my share of ingenuity, too. I took this little old business here and made it a success, just like I did for, well, you might say everything I laid my hands on. <laughs> uh, uh, gas tank, uh, gas tank. Would it be on... The other side? Oh, oh, I knew that. Why, why don't you boys go ahead and stretch your legs? Take your time. Mighty pretty country around here. Yes, uh, pretty. Of course, it wasn't very pretty when I moved in. First thing I did was plant all these trees, hundreds of them. I had to import them from my old friend Luther Burbank. You gotta give them just the right amount of water and a special kind of plant food I cooked up. This is the man, without doubt. Frisbee, is that it? Not a common name. He must be the one. Frisbee? An incredible specimen. Done it all, knows everything, and every one. All the greats. Then what we've heard is true. All of it. Absolutely. He studied at most of the major universities, holds a doctorate in at least eight disciplines. A key man, obviously. Water and oil okay? I believe they are, but I'd feel better if you checked them. Might as well, as long as I'm out here. I'll just open the hood and let me see you now. <laughs> Where's the, uh, the, the latch now? In the front, maybe. Front? Where? Oh, oh, no, 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 what am I thinking? In back? <laughs> of course, where the, where the uh, engine is. <laughs> engine. <laughs> You're a big help, Mr. Frisbee. 
You don't know how much we value your personal attention. Oh, that's okay, boys. Look here. Ain't that something? <laughs> they got the dipstick and all hidden away so's nobody can go messing with them. <laughs> but I can see from here that they're they're just uh, they're they're fine. They're just fine. And uh, yep, that fine and dandy. Well, that ought to do it. How much do we owe you? Looks like five bucks and a couple of cents. Make it five even. Did you bring a supply of local currency? Right here. Which one? Hmm. Will this do? This here's twenty bucks. That what it is. Yes, of course. Twenty. I think I got some change. Change? In my pocket. Uh, uh, hold, hold on now. Did we give you enough? Oh, sure, but you, you got three fives coming back. That's not necessary, Mr. Frisbee. You keep it. Huh? For your trouble. We have no need of it. <laughs> That's mighty decent of you. <laughs> you folks from around here? No, we're from... From quite a ways off. Well, if you're planning to drive a spell, I'd check in someplace first if I was you. And why is that? Those are dangerous-looking clouds. Dangerous? Yes, sir. We're going to have some rain shortly. You can tell when it's going to rain? Rain? Mister, I can tell when the humidity drops one half of one percent. I can predict fog, smog, hail, sleet, snow, dew, and freezing 24 hours before it happens. Really? Well, I was working on a perpetual motion machine in Sioux City, Iowa, back Back in uh, 19 and 21, when I got a call from President Hardy, he was begging me to fly to Washington, D.C. and help him set up their meteorology department. Is that a fact? Not only is it a fact, but I'm giving it to you oversimplified, kind of. Because I'm too modest to say what they put on the medal they gave me after I got them on the right track. That's how come you have weather predictions on the news. Mr. Frisbee, we were wondering if... Not yet. We'll see you later, Mr. Frisbee. You will? You may rely on it. Well, that'd be real nice. Stop on back and we'll sit around and talk some more. But mind what I told you about the weather. Best check into a motel or something till she blows over. We'll do something like that. Thank you so much, Mr. Frisbee. Into the car now, gentlemen. Well, you take care now. Oh, we will. We will. Odd fellers. Why, didn't they believe what you were saying? It ain't that. They just seem kind of odd. Wearing suits like business fellows from the city handed me a $20 bill like they didn't know what it was. How come you didn't tell them you was Andrew Jackson and that was your picture on it? That's one of the few things I ain't heard them claim. Wait around here long enough and you will. Well, we'll see you tomorrow, Frisbee. Yep, see you tomorrow. Turn up, boys. I'll be here. Same as always. Let's see now, uh, five o'clock. Sounds to me like a good time to close. Mr. Frisbee? That's my name. Don't wear it out. <laughs> huh? Mr. Frisbee. Who, who's there? If you walk outside and head east down the highway... Where are you? N no, nobody left in this store but me. If you head east for 200 yards, you'll come upon something extraordinary. Oh, yeah? Like what? An adventure, Mr. Frisbee. New worlds to conquer. How's that? Worlds even you have never dreamed of. Say, where are you hiding? In the back room? Or over by the dry goods? Don't trouble yourself. You won't see us. Well, where are you then? With you, Mr. Frisbee. We are a part of you. And soon, very soon, you will be a part of us for all eternity. You are going to the stars, sir. To the stars. What do you mean, the stars? You talking about going to Hollywood? The stars in the heavens. You're not afraid, are you? Afraid? Me? Stonewall Frisbee? Hey, hey, hey. Dwight David Eisenhower said to me back when I got onto the very first landing craft on D-Day, Stoney, he says to me, Stoney, you lead the invasion. 
There'll be mines, German e-boats, stupid dive bombers, and artillery up against you, but you can do it. Well, Ike, I says, I guess if you really want me to. An exceptional record, Mr. Frisbee, but our time grows short. Will you accept this last greatest adventure? You mean go walking outside? It's not far. Just beyond the first grove of trees. Afraid I can't take you up on that, seeing as how it's going to rain. Then you are frightened. We had thought you'd be the one man willing to take almost any risk. That may be, but who, may I ask, is telling me all this? If you'll walk on down the road, as I suggested, you'll find out. Well, rain or no rain, I never was one to turn down a little excitement. Who, who'd you say you was? Your questions will be answered soon enough. Well, all right, then. Just let me lock up. That won't be necessary. Why not? Because, Mr. Frisbee, you won't be coming back. Well, will you look at that? I sure was right. Gonna be a big old storm tonight. Hurry, Mr. Frisbee. I'm coming. Don't get your long chance in a twist. Straight ahead. We're waiting for you. Where? Look to your right. I, I don't see... Wait, wait a minute. What? What, what the heck? Oh, 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 I get it. I get Some kind of movie prop, right? <laughs> what, what are you doing? Making one of them science fiction movies out here? Uh, dang, if it don't look like one of them flying saucers. That's exactly what it is. You may come inside. Now, how am I going to do that? You got it made to look like there ain't no doors or windows. Very well. In the interests of time, I suppose we can give you a slight assist at this point. Hey, hold on, Mr. Frisbee. Whoa, Nelly. How'd you do that? Teleportation, Mr. Frisbee, but I'm sure you know all about it. Well, what do you know? you got a nice setup in here. I'll give you that. What's underneath all that aluminum paint? Wood frame or drywall? I assure you, it's all quite authentic. Impressed? Me? Impressed? With this rinky-dink set? Why, <laughs> shucks, it looks like a flea and a dog compared to the one I designed for the United States Space Agency. Oh, we didn't know they had flying saucers yet. Apollo, of course, and Viking. Well, mine was called a buzzard. Biggest span you ever saw. And that was back in 51. Old rocket thrust frisbee, they called me. Please, Mr. Frisbee, be good enough to follow me. Well, don't this take all. How do you do, Mr. Frisbee? Welcome, Mr. Frisbee. How do you... So this is part of that movie prop. That's it, ain't it? Some kind of Hollywood thing. Advertising a, a flying saucer picture, huh? In a word, Mr. Frisbee, no. This is an actual spacecraft. Ah, go on now. And we, my colleagues and I, have come here from another planet. We have indeed. All this way, across the interstellar darkness, to meet you. Well, in that case, I'm leaving. Correction, Mr. Frisbee. You are staying. Wait, let me, let me loose. I can't even wiggle my toes. I suggest you stop struggling against the force field and relax. After all, you're going to be here a while. A very long while in Earth terms. Why not make yourself comfortable while you prepare to meet the others? The, the others? That's right. The Intergalactic Council. Well, sir, the government already knew about my research in atomic energy. Matter of fact, I suggested it to him as far back as 1923. Spent a whole summer one time with Al Einstein, during which time I gave him the preliminary stuff about that relativity theory of his. Smart as paint, that fella. Smart as paint. He had bad hair, though. Should have put some brill cream on it. A little dab will do you. <laughs> Anyhow... When I got this here call from New Mexico, I had to hightail it over there and show them how to make the bomb. Incredible. Fantastic. What a specimen. Now, let's see. That covers atomic energy. What was the next thing you fellows asked me about? If you wouldn't mind, sir. Go on. Speak your mind. You're entitled, son. Your 
Your research in liquid propellants. Oh, yes, liquid propellants. Well, now, the main thing I got to say about that is there ain't no liquid in the world that'll propel me faster than a dry martini on the rocks. Ha <laughs> ha. <clears throat> we were referring to liquid propellants as applied to space travel, Mr. Frisbee. Oh, them liquid propellants. I get your drift. Yeah, I developed the first ones used by the Air Force in that old whack corporal rocket, remember? Used to have a model of it out in front of Disneyland. Well, that thing sure could move, thanks to me. Made up a batch of liquid stuff in my cellar. Folks around town wanted me to run for Congress after that, being as how I got the country back into the space race. But if there's one thing I ain't, it's conceited. I figure it's a man's patriotic duty to invent liquid propellants if he has a mind to. And I had a mind to. Why, even as a boy, when I was attending Princeton University on a special scholarship, they used to call me old liquid propellant Frisbee. <laughs> Next question. Forgive me, Mr. Frisbee, but you mentioned... Princeton University, did you not? Sure did, young fella. Nice place, too. Real homey. Of course not as homey as Pitchville Flats. But it was my understanding that you attended the University of Wichita. That one, too. I can see how you'd get a mite confused. It happens to be a fact that I hold degrees in 38 major universities and advanced schools of learning. Amazing. One earth It beggars the imagination. I also got me one of them Rhodes Scholarships over in England one time, but I had turned it down because I wouldn't bow to the Queen. Next question. No more? In that case, well, I'll just get on home to dinner. I said it was getting late and I have to get home to dinner. <gasps> hey, you guys. About time I was leaving. I gather that you don't quite understand the situation, Mr. Frisbee. How's that? You're not going home for dinner. You shall have dinner here. Here? Precisely. In exactly, well, 14 minutes by your measure of time, we'll be departing. Departing? From where to where? From here to our planet. You see, Mr. Frisbee, our assignment here was to secure a representative Earth species, the most brilliant we could find. There seems to be no question that your accomplishments are far and away more extensive than any other human beings. Uh, my, mine? Uh, now, now wait a minute, now, hold on there. You fellas got the wrong idea. Why, I'm, I'm just a plain old country boy, a, a bumpkin. I'm a bumpkin. That's what I am, just a rube with a big mouth. Come now, Mr. Frisbee. You do yourself a terrible injustice. We know all about you and your accomplishments. My accomplishments? Mr. The one accomplishment you fellas didn't pick up on is the fact that I am the gall darndest liar that ever walked the pike. I spend the longest yarn west of the Rockies, and I'm not talking about exaggerating. I'm talking about lies. I mean lies. Mr. Frisbee. Don't you get it? I'm a liar. I ain't got enough truth in me to raise a bump on a bee. There are some terms that have no equivalent in our language. This word lie that you mention. Dang right lie. That there is the opposite of the truth. Don't you have that on your planet? Have what, Mr. Frisbee? Have a fellow that runs around talking the bull off a nickel? I'm afraid not. We have no concept of this term. You mean, you mean whatever somebody says goes without saying? That is the truth? So everything I told you Every doggone piece of hair brain guff I've been throwing at you. You believe it? And now you're taking me up to your planet so you can stick me in a cage? Oh, hardly that, Mr. Frisbee. It won't be a cage. We'll naturally have to keep you confined, much as we do the other specimens we've collected. We've got a marvelously entertaining Venusian. He sings simultaneously in eight different octaves. And he accompanies himself on percussion with his tail. Now, you listen to me. I'm a bona fide American citizen, and I got my rights. And furthermore... Please contain yourself, Mr. Frisbee. Since we'll be departing very shortly, you have your choice of dinner now or later. Perhaps you'd prefer waiting. What is your pleasure? I'll tell you what my pleasure is. 
My pleasure is to punch you right smack dab on the jaw. What the... Don't be alarmed, Mr. Frisbee. That was only a mask. A disguise we used to pass among Earthlings. This is my real face underneath. I hope its appearance doesn't unduly disturb you. Uh, Mr. Frisbee? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Mr. Frisbee! Oh, oh my, he came back. Where, where am I? Feeling better, Mr. Frisbee? Better than what? I thought I should tell you. We'll be departing in five minutes. You still on that kick? Listen to me. I ain't interested in departing anywhere, except from you. I never been more than 50 miles outside of Pitchville in my life, and that's the one record I'm right proud of. Curious remark. It does not compute. You took a bump to the head. Lie still. I'd better scan you. Get that thing away from me. It's only a vibrometabolic scanner to detect organic damage. Stay back, I tell you. You're in perfect shape. No spikes in your brain waves. None whatsoever. Remarkable, I must say, for someone with such active cranial matter. Man, the last time I saw something like you, I'd been four days on a corn jug. And even at that, what I thought I saw was a whole lot prettier than you. I'm sorry you find my features distasteful. On our planet, my appearance is considered quite satisfactory. But if you prefer, I could wear another one of those pseudo-faces. This place where you're from, do the girls look like that too? The females? Why do you ask? Because if they do, it's a downright wonder you ain't extinct. Please try to accept my true appearance, Mr. Frisbee, much as we have become accustomed to yours. Some effort is required on both sides. Shall we, I believe the customary phrase is, shake on it? Don't point your finger at me. What you got there, a claw? A gesture of friendship, Mr. Frisbee. Hands across the galaxy and all that. Well, okay, but don't you go pinching me. Uh, you're built hard as a crawfish, I'll say that. Oh, we are indeed, by your standards. Which is quite fortunate for us, considering the gravitational pressures on our home planet. You have a match on you? Pardon? For my pipe. Hold on. I, I gotta light my overalls. What are you doing? Helps me relax. A pinch of Prince. Uh, hmm. One time a guy come in my store and he says, You got Prince Albert in a can? And I says, No, I already went and let him out. <laughs> Oh, never mind. You boys wouldn't understand. I, I, I'm afraid there's no smoking on the ship. Well, who ever heard of a rule like that? It upsets the negative ion balance. No, I really ain't going. What do you think of that? Well, I suppose if you sit over here, directly under the laminar flow... Kind of chilly. Ooh. Don't you boys have a wood-burning stove at least? Much get mighty close to freezing up there in outer space. What's that? Oh, that? <laughs> oh, that's just my old harmonica. Want I should play you a little tune? Oh, please! Please, Mr. Frisbee! I've been meaning to give a concert one of these days. Maybe Carnegie Hall, or over in Branford. Oh, attention! X10 and X12! I need you here at once! <laughs> most beautiful sound there is, huh? They have harmonicas where you guys are from? Well, do they? I ask you a question. Do you have harmonicas up there where you... Where you Help! Help! You, 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 you don't look so good. Kind of, kind of green. <laughs> Whoa, well, let me play some more for you. <laughs> Ain't nothing like a little tune before dinner. That's what I always say. What's that horrible sound? It, it's that object. I've got to get it away from him before it's too late. Back. It's dangerous. Stay away from it. Save yourself. Oh. What's the matter, boys? Don't you like my playing? Huh? Boys? Oh, boys? 
Frisbee, old son, something tells me this is your chance. You better make tracks, and I mean now. They didn't call you old mile-a-minute Frisbee for nothing. Get moving. What are you doing out of your room, Mr. Frisbee? Mr. Frisbee? Don't let him off the ship. Quickly, seal the airlock. No, you don't, boy. Get out of my way. No. Don't go after him. He has some sort of fantastic instrument that emits a death sound. I've never heard a pitch like it. It's powerfully destructive. We'd best take off before he warns others of his kind. They may have the same weapon. Can't catch this old boy, can you? Go on, get out of here. Get on back where you come from. <laughs> That's it. Scout. <laughs> Quiet. Douse the lights. Here he comes. What? 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 What's going on here? Will somebody tell me what's happening here? What do you mean, what's happening? It's your birthday, ain't it? As if you didn't know. And this here is a surprise party. As if you didn't know that either. <laughs> Congratulations, Frisbee. Put her there, old buddy. Well, I sure didn't expect nothing like this. <laughs> the heck you didn't. <laughs> the present. Give him the present, Dad. Come and I've been waiting all day for this. Got it right here. What are you waiting for? Go on, Frisbee, open it up. Well, you folks sure sprung one on me. Want me to help you get the paper off? No, no, I can get it. Go ahead, read it. What is it, some kind of trophy? It's what they call a loving cup. Went into town and ordered it special. Go on, read it out loud. For the first time, Frisbee is at a loss for words. I'll read it for him. World's Greatest Liar, Mr. Somerset Frisbee, presented by his friends on the occasion of his 63rd birthday. Folks, all I can think to say is, mighty nice of you all. Mighty nice. Ain't you gonna make a speech? Yeah, Yeah, Frisbee, tell us one of them real whoppers. Like where you been the last couple of hours? Was you inventing something, or maybe you just took a quick trip to the moon? Well, you ain't far wrong, and that's a fact. I knowed it. I've been waiting for this all day. First off, you know who them fellas was in that car? Which car? That little foreign job come in here for gas, remember? The President of the United States and the Secret Service. Well, I'll tell you who them fellas was. They was from outer space. <laughs> oh, isn't he the living end? And somehow or other, they picked me up in the air, right down there by the hollow, and I floated over to their flying saucer, and they took me inside, and then they was going to kidnap me and take me to their planet. And you was going to be their leader, Frisbee? <laughs> but, but, but it's true. They was just about to kidnap me, wanted to make me their A1 prize specimen. Oh, the whole Galactic Council was watching. They even had a guy from Venus who could sing eight different ways from sundown. And play the drum with his tail. Well, sir, you know how I stopped him? You talked him to death? No, not that. It weren't nothing, really. Just took out my mouth harp and blowed a little tune, something like this. You know what happened then? I'm sure you're going to tell us. I've been waiting all day for this. They just plumb fainted away. Now that I can believe. (laughs) Play us a tune, Somerset, the way you used to. Well, I suppose I could do that if you really want to hear it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. There it is. Didn't I tell you it was going to rain? Sure I did. I can feel it in these old bones of mine. Yes, sir. What did I tell you? 
What did I tell you? Ain't he the perfect limit? Ain't he the be-all and end-all? <laughs> Mr. Somerset Frisbee, who might have profited by reading an Aesop fable, the one about the boy who cried wolf. For now, consider this one more tall tale from the timberlands of the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Hocus Pocus and Frisbee, starring Shelley Berman, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling, from a story by Frederick Lewis Fox, and adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison. Heard in the cast were Mike Novak, Richard Hensel, Turk Muller, Sarah Marks, Jeff Lupatin, Christian Stolte, and Doug James. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Paul Patch, Terry Jennings, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. <laughs>